Okay, welcome to the September 25th Issaquah City Council Land and Shore Committee. We have uh, three items on our agenda tonight. The first one is Agenda Bill 7459, termination of Costco easement, uh, which is coming back to us um, after um, its first time earlier this month. Keith Niven here is um, ready, I think, to talk to us. I am. Dates, um, perhaps. So thank you. Um, so to, oops, I'm going to start there. I'm going to start here. Uh, so to remind the committee, um, this is a request by uh, Costco to um, partially terminate um, what's called easement R. Um, and as you can see from this diagram, uh, easement R extends onto Costco's property. Um, the width of it varies um, from north to south. Um, but this was a condition that was put on the original master site plan um, to ensure that uh, there was a public trail uh, that would parallel Issaquah Creek um, along the Pickering Eastern property edge. And so um, uh, the conversation uh, we had last time um, uh, identified this as really basically kind of a remnant from the development agreement that uh, really uh, should be terminated at this point. And there was a question about just wanting some information about what it looked like. And so um, staff provided the committee um, a follow-up diagram. So this is an aerial photograph um, with some photos taken to uh, show both the uh, dimension of the um, existing trail. And so this is the trail uh, right here. Um, this is the property line for Costco. And as you can see, as you go from north to south, um, the distance uh, between the trail and the property line um, varies um, from kind of smallest areas around five to seven feet, and it gets to over uh, about 30 to 40 feet uh, in width as it moves to the south end. So um, that's really kind of a, a, a summary from the administration. I know that Costco would like to uh, say a few words before the committee deliberates on this or ask for public comment. So um, if you would like to do that next, um, I'm ready to turn it over to, I think Rich Olin from Costco would like to address the committee. Sure. Good evening, as you know, I'm Rich Olin, and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you this evening about the easement R matter, and thank you very much for continuing to uh, consider the request that we have for the partial termination of, of easement R. Uh, as I said, the last time when we met, it's Costco's position that this is basically a housekeeping issue, as Keith just explained, and as I believe the staff also feels the same way, uh, this is something that was uh, uh, removed from our uh, conditions of approval when the city when the city did their master site plan amendment. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how we got here, just so it's so it's clear everybody everybody understands that uh, easement R was established in 1987 when the conditions of approval were established for the master site plan for Pickering Place. It was a huge development for the city of Issaquah at that time, and there were numerous conditions. Uh, then in connection with the negotiation of the development agreement that we went through with, this, with the city, and which the council eventually passed, in 2014, the city council approved a major amendment to the master site plan. As a result of that major amendment, all of the conditions that were established in 1987 were extinguished with the exception of three, which are not relevant to this conversation. So easement R was terminated as a result of that action. Uh, what we are looking to do is to get the approval from the council to have the appropriate documents executed and then go go forward to to eliminate that easement R as a matter as a matter of record but uh, Costco always wants to be a good corporate citizen it's important to us to do that and in this particular case it's also important that we be good partners with the city of Issaquah we feel uh, I feel very strongly about this partnership as does as the representative of Costco 
Uh, we've worked on long and hard with the city and we'll be together for a long, long time. So uh, we want to try to do the right thing, which is what we always try to do. That's why when we uh, had the development agreement, final conversations about it, Costco offered to pay $150,000, contribute that to the city for the city to use in its discretion for the only limits were what it was agreed to, that that money would be for trails and for wayfinding in both Pickering Place and in Lake Sammamish State Park. And so you, you will soon have that money as soon as I get direction from the city about who you want me to mail it to. I, I'm eager, eager, to give it, eager to give it to you. Uh, so to address some of the comments that we heard last time from citizens and also from, from the committee, then uh, what Costco has decided to do is to contribute and offer to contribute an additional $20,000 to the city of Issaquah. Uh, this would be, again, money that the city could use at its discretion, but uh, the only uh, linkage would be that we would want this money to go for exactly what we're talking about, which are as much Money that you can use, city can use, for uh, enhancements for the Pickering Trail in the vicinity, general vicinity of the Costco Eastern Costco's Eastern property, and whatever those enhancements may be, whether it's relocation of trails or widening of trails or additional landscaping or whatever, whatever the city would like. Uh, we believe that this set of enhancements that you can use the money for would help you, would help the city achieve its objectives with respect to the tra entire trail system, which is really kind of a treasure for the, for the city. It would also be an amenity for the Costco employees who are going to be inhabiting that uh, our car corporate campus and will be even closer to the trail. And of course, will be amenity for the city of Issaquah's citizens and for the greater community as well. So we hope you agree. We renew our request that uh, you recommend to the city council that uh, they approve what's necessary in order to do this partial termination of Eastman R. And I, I thank you for considering it. And if you had any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Great, thanks, Rich. Questions from the committee? I don't have any questions, uh, but uh, thank you, Rich. Thanks uh, for the presentation uh, and uh, for the generosity, both in the original DA and uh, what you just laid out in front of us. I do think that um, the business in front of the council, this, this committee this evening is, is the um, is the housekeeping item regarding the easement. So um, I don't have any questions about that. I'd like to I like to move forward with that as proposed in the packet. Mary Lou, actually, not a question for you, Rich. Question for Keith. Um, just looking at the agenda bill, the motion hasn't changed, but um, Rich did mention two things, and one is that the $150,000 from the original agreement uh, be spent in this area doing improvements, and the second was that an additional amount be spent in, in that. How does the motion need to read if that is going to be considered tonight? Because the if motion that, doesn't read that way. Excuse me. If, if you heard that, I must have been unclear. Okay. All I was saying was that with respect to the $20,000, it would be linked. The $150,000, there's absolutely no there's change. I'm not proposing That's any great. changes whatsoever. I apologize if I was well, not clear actually, about that. Actually, that is, I misstated it. So the $20,000, how does that fit into what we're looking at tonight? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, so the agenda bill, um, I think, is clear about uh, its purpose is to terminate the easement. I think what has come out of this conversation is Costco's willingness to provide some additional benefit to the community um, uh, as part of its own interest in partnering with the city. So I don't know that it has to, so, so it, it seems like it shouldn't be part of this agenda bill. It seems like it, it should stay as a separate um, action um, and whether or not Costco provides two checks or we work that out as a separate maybe letter arrangement between uh, Rich and, and maybe Bob, you know, we can work that out but that's I think okay. at another it, point. That's fine if it's not part of the motion. I guess the second piece then is that the reason I had asked the questions last time was because when you walk that or you look on it in an aerial map and you take into account that the trail was established once under one set of codes and now is being 
will exist under a different code, which could put a very tall building right next to it. How do, um, I think what Costco is proposing is excellent because I believe it will completely enhance the trail user's experience down at that end. But how do we make sure that there's some sort of direction to go ahead and do that. Like, as you'll notice, I think your comment at the last meeting was that there's trees along the whole thing, but there isn't trees along the whole thing. There's many places where the trees are actually on Costco's property, and because of their setbacks, that those trees may not exist anymore. So how do we end up with the outcome that we end up with in the housekeeping and getting a trail that uh, is enjoyable for Costco's employees and other trail users? Sure. Um, so there's a, there's a number of questions embedded in that, yeah, I think. Absolutely. You know, it's not only about the character of the trail and the trail experience, um, it's the function of the trail. You know, right now that's an eight foot wide paved trail, which doesn't really meet any of our current standards for multi-use um, facilities. Uh, it should be at least 12, if not 15 feet wide. So part of this is, um, given the fact that there is some funds available from Costco to potentially rebuild part of the trail um, or to add additional vegetation. I mean, I think there's choices and I know that as part of the park plan. So part of um, what we did this last week was uh, we walked that trail with Costco's architects and um, Jeff Watling and Matt Meckler um, to talk about what could be a good solution for an outcome for this if we were gonna do something. And, and we talked about not only potentially moving the trail farther east, uh, closer to the creek, um, but also probably expanding it in width, um, plus also then looking at, there needs to be this bigger conversation about um, you know, the, the the proposed building that Costco has is is going to, you will see it. Um, you know, you can see the parking garage, um, you know, but you have to kind of look, it's it's semi-screened. Um, and, and I think we just need to be purposeful for what we think the character of that trail should be. It's gonna change, you know, you go basically from the semi-wooded area to, you know, the, um, the crossing over the creek on the new 62nd Street, and then you join in with King County's Lake Samantha Trail, right? And so, and there you're kind of going along. Um, you've got the new mini storage and the new Gilman lofts that you hit right before you hit Gilman. So, part of it is what does that trail experience want to be? And I think Parks Department is thinking about that. And, and I'm not sure they've completely set their mind to what that should be. Um, but I think there's at least some funds available for them to help achieve that vision okay. when they're ready to do that. Okay. Thanks. So uh, I don't know whether to ask you or Rich, the $20,000 amount, how did that amount get arrived at? Um, I think that, um, I, I think you came up with that, if it's my recollection. We didn't think we needed to make any contribution, but we thought that was a meaningful sum. And uh, getting some idea about what some costs might be associated with some of the work that the city might want. For example, there's a section of the trail which was identified by Keith and the uh, parks director that uh, seemed to be one that the city had some interest in perhaps relocating farther to the east. It's not part of the existing project, which itself has portions of the trail moving moving to the east. Um, so we got some estimates on that and we came up with a number that we thought was a meaningful percentage of what that of that what that would be. And we just wanted to make a statement that would, so it's it's real real money and it could go towards something like that, but you don't have to use it for that. Okay. Thank you. Oh. Yeah I Good conversation. The trail was great. Of course, when we did the DA three years ago, I mean, uh, I think Costco, like, you know, made a nice um, um, concession at that time for the unconstrained funds of $150,000, which I think our intent was to to do something there. So that's a good conversation. Um, I, I think procedurally, um, we should figure out where that conversation goes next, whether it's here or someplace else, and to maybe formalize that. But um, I, th I'm, I think this evening we should just kind of move on with the question at hand, which is the easement. Well, I think we are. I think, okay. I think that's what we're talking about. But if there aren't any questions, then any other? Mary Lou? 
So I just wanted to say thank you again to the Costco team. I had the great pleasure of being on the Development Commission ever since you first came to town. Uh, first with the store, then with the offices, and it's been amazing. Signing the new development agreement and you investing in Issaquah for another 20 years is just fabulous. Um, and it's going to look different. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate you going and taking a walk with staff to look at it. Um, I think one of the, the most fun things over in Lake Sammamish State Park is how many Costco workers you see over there at lunch using the trails and walking around. Mm -hmm. It's a great asset for you just like it is for the city. So even the next generation of Costco buildings are going to look a little different. I'm sure they're going to be beautiful. But behind them will be a really nice trail. Good for you and good for us. And again, wonderful partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you for that comment, and I agree. We take this partnership very seriously, and uh, we want to be part of the process to en enhance the amenities within the city. And we're thrilled to be here, and we continue to grow, and we'll grow more. So, um, allow for public comment before we just get funny. <laughs> Uh, a little more money to sc have things sc screened in 20 years, but you know, it's better than I was expecting. I do, I, I, I would also um, ask for water f for landscaping irrigation because I'm not sure where the nearest hookup for the, for plants to be irrigated would be if the city planted in that area. So I, I don't know if, if that's something that actually has to be negotiated or if somebody, because without water, they'll die anyway. Uh, with code, you increase the impervious surface and then you're supposed to offset the um, land that you increase within your critical area buffer somewhere. And so I'm not sure what this does to, uh, where, where we can put this somewhere if we remove this piece of land, but you just have to consider where you're going to be putting that in. Also, um, if you move the trail where you need to move the trail, is it keeping it uh, within the last 75% of the buffer per code so that we don't have to move into a situation where we are out of code compliance when we move things. My memory isn't isn't good. I perceive that we're okay, but I don't want to just willy-nilly say, hey, it should be fine, and then we're working against the code. So anyway, but $20,000, you can plant a lot of trees for that. But we want your water too, if you don't mind. <laughs> Any other public comment? Okay. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a little bit confused about the um, about the recommendation. If it would seem to me that if the committee decides to recommend um, supporting this, that it would be in that motion because it would be um, because the twenty thousand dollars is linked. So it would. I mean, it's linked to this agenda bill. It's not a, are you saying it would be different agenda bill? So, um, so I, you know me, and um, I'm kind of like in the process. Um, I, my suggestion would be that when Costco writes the $150,000 check, which per the development agreement they're ready to do now, I just haven't figured out who to give that to. Um, they just write a second check for 20 grand and so it all is basically done in the next couple weeks. So I don't know that we need any agenda bills or anything um, other than, um, you know, we can execute a letter between the mayor and, and uh, Craig, if it needs to be Craig or any of the <laughs> parties in the room, um, if we need documentation. But I don't know that there needs to be more than that. It I would think it just needs to be captured somewhere <clears throat> that that twenty thousand dollars is linked to this area, right? For the for trails, right? Something and in this and area. right, and because of their intent, I assume that would be in the letter. Yeah. So maybe Patrick can draft one up since he's sitting in the back with his laptop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So other than that, okay. other than that question. Um, and then um, I'm, I support this. Um, I do want to say that um, 
First of all, I appreciate the extra time uh, because um, I think we get a, uh, we, this is a better outcome for, for um, everyone, I think. You know, Rich, as you alluded to, even their uh, Costco um, employees. Um, it's been mentioned several times about this being housekeeping, and I did um, look at all of the documents that were referred to in the letter that were not included um, originally. And um, I think the part that um, was, a, was hard for me in terms of the word housekeeping is um, uh, vacating some open space I don't think is ever housekeeping. That doesn't mean that I, and, and I, I thought Patrick's letter was right on. Um, it was consistent with the, what the parties were trying to do. Um, I think at the, um, at the, and if it's not consistent, at the, at the very least, we have change conditions that, um, that I think warrant justify doing this. Um, so I, I, so I just wanted to say that's that's where my heartburn was with the use of housekeeping. Um, but I, but and, and I'm not. Positive, it's an obligation, but I, but I feel it's the right thing to do, or I, my opinion is it's the right thing to do, based on um, history and what we did with the development agreement. I think it's the right thing to do, and then I want to commend Costco for being responsive to the concerns um, about the location of the trail, and as Mary Lou said, great partnership over the years. We're very, very proud to have um, this be your home base, and um, and very happy to continue to. Um, to be working with you. So I do support it. Um, as I said, it's my opinion. It's my, that's my opinion. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, the, the, so the motion that's in here isn't much, but have we, I assume that everybody's looked at the, uh, is there a, a form of a resolution or what, what's the actual official action so it's um, it's to there is nothing really Sorry. in here to execute. So it's uh, it's to execute. Uh, um, so there's a um, there's a draft um, vacation termination. Yeah, it's a termination ag ag agreement of the easement mm -hmm. um, that Jim hasn't reviewed yet because he's been out. Um, so if if he gets a chance to review it, um, then my hope would be to move it forward to the October 2 council meeting. If he's not ready to do that because of his backlog, then it'll be the 16th. So there's a so there's basically a legal document to terminate the portion of the easement that was identified in the previous okay. slide. Okay, so there'd be, yeah. there's still, there's still an ordinance and there's still a, this document that uh, addresses the details that yes. has to be put ordinance? together. Yes. And it's not in this packet. Won't be an ordinance. Oh, what? Yeah. To terminate the easement. It'll okay. be just to execute the termination document. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a vacation, basically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That, did you have anything else? No. Thanks for asking that question. Um. So you wonder. You're wondering. So I support it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I figured. Uh, yes, you support it. You support it, mm -hmm. and yes, regular business. Regular business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll be there anyway. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate the support. Sure. Thank you. We love the partnership. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. I feel bad for you. <laughs> struggle being here when you're ill. Okay, next item on the agenda, Agenda Bill 7312-2017 Regional really Agenda. Either one of those. Or is it fuzzy? And it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's good up there. Three and four. <laughs> it's the low res screen. Low res. <laughs> good evening. Hi, Bob. Nice to see you all here at a more godly hour than the last time. So um, so here we are back again, last committee. To introduce committee. yourself. Oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> you Bob, are? Bob Harrison, City Administrator for Esquaw. Thank you. Um, and so uh, we have the kind of the final uh, leg of the uh, regional agenda. It's uh, hit the other committees at this point. These were the two remaining aspects, which is the housing and growth management piece. 
um, and we can kind of walk through those tonight. Um, <clears throat> and Paul, you had a lot of input in developing this piece, so you may want to uh, help, uh, you know, facilitate and lead the conversation. Um, but starting on growth management, the first one here is the objective of a strong urban growth boundary. How do you want to go through these? Just so yeah, we, if you want to, should we just hit the? Uh, if well, we could do it more broadly since you had it. You had one touch before, and if there's any questions or if you want to talk about any of the pieces on the action items on there or the status, we could do that. And if you're comfortable with now it's everything for, on this section up, uh, then we could just move on to the next one, unless there's a desire for additional conversation on them. Can we start with the goal? Perfect. So um, I think originally it was planned for responsible, sustainable regional growth. Mm -hmm. And then now this one, it looks to be, because it says it's the PSRC's Vision 2040 Regional Growth Strategy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so why, why would we have PSRC's vision in here, our goal, where? So I, I proposed just because I thought that the way that it, uh, what it said, how it said it, and it, it was my feeling that these words aligned pretty well with what our intent mm -hmm. uh, was when it comes to growth management, both within the city and as our role within the region as well. Um, and and um, so I'm reading the regional growth strategy, kind of pull that out, put that reference in there. Um, I, think, I think it says very well um, what I think our goal ought to be. Okay. So I guess looking at this today, and it's probably my disconnect with what I, I thought, how I thought this would look and what it's turning out to look like. I thought what this would be would be a couple of pages for council members to be able to read through and grasp what we're trying to achieve. And I, it's turning now more into like a, a white paper or something. I don't know. I, I would read that as a new council member and really not get a lot out of it. So, I don't know. The, the goal the or? Goal. Oh. Like I, I, I had assumed that the goal would be an Issaquah-centric goal, but one that would require regional cooperation. And when you got to the objectives, you would see objectives it's stated an objective and then an action that sh talked about which regional partner you're working with. So I expected a pretty Issaquah, Issaquah-centric goal at the top, not a, not a regional goal or a state goal, but our goal, what do we want? And then the object objectives would be, who do we partner with to get there? What are the kinds of things we're looking for? So I'm trying to pretend I'm a new council member coming on and reading this, and I'm the one who's gonna be on PSRC's MPB next year, and <coughs> what am I supposed to be doing when I'm sitting in the chair? And I'm, I'm not sure I get a lot out of that goal. But I don't care if we use it. I mean, I don't. so I so I appreciate your explanation. I think what what looks a little strange is to just state at the end. This is PSRC's vision 2040 because that then raises the question that I raised, which is why don't we have? Why is that there? Why wouldn't we have our own goal? So I, um, so I understand that you like those words, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know. I don't know either if it's it's a centric enough but I don't have any other language. language to put in there right now. So. Um. <clears throat> Would it be a benefit to delete the citation? Because <laughs> I, you know, there's nothing it's in there like that's. plagiarism. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That would um, be uh, in opposition to where the city's kind of been on these right. policies. Um, or I think the other option is to just to leave it general, which what was just what we had before. Um, that we want responsible, sustainable, um, and then it said regional growth. So 
I don't know that we want regional growth in there. Um, I don't know. Anyway, okay. I'll say it again, if I may. Um, I think you can bring these all down to the city level. Very, it's easy for me to talk to look uh, talk about planning for growth that minimizes environmental impact. That's we can we can dive down to that a little bit easier, a little bit more, like any of these. But um, I like that growth that minimizes environmental impact, growth that supports economic prosperity. Okay, so that's still very vitally important. There's many different elements uh, to that as well. Growth that promotes adequate and affordable housing. I mean, that's very consistent with some of the other goals of this agenda as well. And we have one specifically on housing and growth management is about uh, uh, providing for sufficient and or adequate housing affordable to all. Uh, improving mobility, that's a very important part about uh, growth either within our city, mm -hmm. within the region as well. And of course, you know, making, you know, making as efficient a use as possible in, of existing infrastructure. It's very easy for me to look at all of those and see them within the context of the city. And that's why I proposed it. And it's very nice um, that it scales well uh, to the region as well. <clears throat> and I think when we wanna work uh, within the region, um, uh, uh, you know, making it very clear that certain tenets of, of the uh, Vision 2040 and the regional growth strategy uh, we feel are, are consistent for Issaquah as well. And we're even, we even feel strong enough, you know, that we could use part of it within our own regional agenda. I think that's a really good step when it comes to working with our regional partners on things that we want to do within the growth management um, uh, arena. So, so I, um, I don't have any difficulty. I think it's easy to apply it to Issaquah, those sets of principles. Uh, I think it says, uh, and it's also a strong statement to our regional partners of where we would stand. For instance, out there. So I think maybe in 2018 or 19, when do we sit back down at the table with the county to talk more numbers? 2018? The growth within numbers? the next couple of years. Yeah, within the next couple of years, yeah. So if we're gonna sit down with the county and the state, we're gonna talk about what our next growth target is. And I look at this statement, this goal that we have for the city, and we've already met our 2031 target and we're talking what our 2056 target's gonna be. I don't know how that statement helps me. Like I don't know, I don't know what I'm going in to negotiate with them because we haven't got the affordable housing from the first set of goals, we haven't improved mobility, and yes, we put stuff where there's existing infrastructure to service it, but that I, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know what I'm doing at the table. And I thought the whole point of this was to educate us in our interactions, and um, I don't know, I just, I can't, I can't walk myself through it. I, I, Paul, I certainly don't disagree at all that the, those words um, certainly can apply to uh, Issaquah, growth management in Issaquah, but they also would apply to probably every other jurisdiction and city in the region. Um, like I said, I don't um, have any other words, um, but I think uh, just from a, a I guess it would be nice to have our own goal for growth management rather than somebody else's goal. But I agree, I totally agree with you. It's not hard for me at all to see how you can apply these. So, um, but I don't have anything different right now. Um, anyway, okay. What was Other this, comments? The status piece, Bob, under the participate, testify, and GMA review process? Did that happen this year? Or is that too uh, th Was it the fourth one here? There's I'm sorry. column, Bob, where it says status question mark. Right there, stop. Status. Ah, so um, the uh, state just uh, finalized the funding for that uh, out of the last budget, and then uh, we've not had the opportunity to go okay. out and testify in the uh, Ruckelshaus project. Uh, we did uh, testify at the first hearing they had on growth management in general. Um, they've kind of took pros, and there are a handful of us, and there are a lot of cons. Uh, a lot of the school districts, because of the concerns of locating urban growth boundaries, and then 
Uh, some of the builders obviously would like some adjustments there to enable um, some growth, but uh, um, I think that one's gonna be much more important going into 2018 that we get engaged with uh, the UW study that's gonna be coming out of that. <clears throat> Um, for, uh, under actions, the third one down, Bob, where it says track legislation in Olympia pertaining to GMA. Yes. And then it says take, and then it, um, take positions against changes that compromise the GMA. Um, one of the concerns I have about that sentence is that the GMA, I don't know where the process is, but it's being reviewed, I th right? Yes. Um, and so, I don't know what compromise the GMA means. I think in the context of this, we're talking about um, making sure that we're watching it so that we can advocate for, um, that we, we can watch it so there aren't proposed changes that are negative to Issaquah. Because I think there are, I, um, some people might say that some of the proposed changes might compromise the GMA, but they are changes that we might support. I think the language could be a little bit different. I think there's some presupposing there that I'm not sure is, I don't know, you know what I'm trying to say? I do, actually, it's a good point, because there may be some that uh, the city has a position that would be exactly as you explained it. So. Um, you know, there are some opportunities to make some changes that would improve the GMA from, I think, the city's perspective. Um, one of the things I think that this leads to, it's a pretty broad statement there, um, that the legislative agenda would have a lot more details. We see bills kind of roll out and the council would get a much broader opportunity, you know, through that legislative agenda process. Um, but this is a, so you, we could, I think, accomplish what you suggested, that if you just added, uh, take, a compromise of GMA and is inconsistent with Issaquah's, uh, you know, policy perspective. Or it could even just be, it could, be, it, it could even just be track legislation Olympia pertaining to the, to the GMA. I mean, it could just be that. Yes, because, it could. Mm -hmm. Because that's something that's ongoing um, rather than taking making statements, determining what we're gonna do based on the changes that are proposed changes. Anyway, those are just my comments on that. Um, and then under objectives, the third one down, it says an objective, an, object, an objective is an informed public and elected officials on the region's vision for growth management. I don't understand what that means. What, what does having the objective uninform, uninformed public mean? I'll, I'll take that, I may. Okay. So the region has come together such that it has uh, it with under, um, uh, it was you know, started by the GMA itself. PSRC has um, kind of codified it with the vision uh, statements that they have and then the regional growth strategy. Um, and so there is kind of this regional vision for growth management, which is captured within you know, that, that body of work. Uh, and, and, the, and it would be really good if elected officials making policy decisions about growth management and, and the public in general had a better understanding of what that vision is, what we're trying to do at that, the region's trying to do at these highest levels. So that's, it's about education. It's about being informed. It's uh, about knowing, um, you know, what, uh, about the laws and what they're intending to do, what GMA is trying to do, uh, what our regional growth strategy tries to do so that we can make, we can have ongoing policy discussions uh, not only among ourselves as elected officials, but the public themselves also can contribute to that dialogue, especially since, um, you know, GMA will, as you said, that Reckle House study is gonna try to develop a roadmap uh, for potential changes. And the more we, the elected, and also the general public is aware of the overall framework for the vision of, for growth management, we're all better off. 
That was a bit. That was part of the reason for the um, the Forterra study uh, that we um, we authorized to be part of was to to gauge. Um, um, understanding and develop some type of programs to help people, elected and general public, be more informed. So, how does that support our growth management goal? <coughs> people being more informed. We're going to have conversations about growth management. We're going to make policy decisions about growth management. The more people are informed, the better. Yeah. So I don't disagree with that at all, and okay. I. So I'm just, I just question whether it belongs in the regional agenda. Well, it's something we were collaborating with. It shouldn't say, it, you know, um, with uh, Kirkland and Redmond and Forterra. So they're outside entities, and we're not trying to do that by ourselves. Sure. That's why. Okay. So a question on this one then. On the far column, which I can't remember, I think it's status. Yes. It talks about exploring public opinion. But then that uh, objective side, it's on education. So a, the explore public opinion, I do get, because I think if we're going to grow successfully, we all have to buy into it and we have to know what the public is thinking. Mm -hmm. That's a little different than educating the public. So I'm not that familiar with the Forterra EMC, but is it an education thing or is it a public opinion <coughs> uh, piece? My understanding, it is. It, it started with the survey, and they will be preparing some, uh, helping us develop some type of communication based upon the results of the, the, the survey and what they've learned. Helping us educate us, develop some type of communication program to help us as elected, and also to get more in, with that new understanding, getting information out to the public. So yes, I think there's going to be, there's probably. Another status. Does it go on to the next page? No, it doesn't. That that is still to come, uh, I believe. That's the development of of a kind of an education strategy and, and communication program. We could add that. Okay. Yeah, I'm. Um I'm having a little bit of trouble figuring out how this one fits squarely under growth management. Um, because it's not about managing growth, it's about education. So, I, and I understand your explanation. I, I totally do. Um, and I understand that there are words in here that make it appear as though it fits under this goal, at least to me, but I don't think it does. Um, it is something that we're participating in, but we're helping with, um, and I supported that. Um, but I just am not sure it belongs. Just because we're doing something doesn't necessarily mean it belongs in the regional agenda. That's where, that's kind of where I'm disconnect here. So. Anyway, that's all. That's my comment on that. Did you have any comments, Bob? Um. The only comment I'll make at the end is uh, kind of gather all the all the feedback that I hear tonight, and then I'll make some proposed suggestions and meet with the chair to talk about how we get there. Because it doesn't seem like there's general consensus on some of these, so I'll try sure. my best to come up with the edits. Okay. <clears throat> um, uh. School siting within Issaquah and preserve open space. And then there was the one that we had a little confusion about that Maya added, <laughs> and I did some edits to oh, that. Oh, you're the red? Well. You're yeah, the red? yeah, okay. I added some of the red in there. So some other things were added too, it looks like. Stacey? Yeah, yeah, Paul. Before we, before we move further on down uh -huh. the document, I, I still um, um, don't think we've uh, fully uh, addressed even the first objective. Uh, we, I mean, unless you guys had some questions uh, and 
I was hoping to give maybe a little bit more of the thinking because again, this kind of document, there's real no, there's not a lot of narrative with this. And so, the, you know, the first objection, the first objective says a strong urban growth boundary. And we can maybe talk about that wording, but as we know, you know, the, er, there's a reason there's not, you know, more growth up the I-90 corridor or down the Hobart Road or up Tiger Mountain because, because of that urban growth boundary. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know uh, many in Issaquah um, care about that quite a bit. So that objective within the context of the goals, like let's, let's um, you know, let's, uh, uh, you know, trying to minimize, you know, environmental impact, you know, that's one way to look at that by having that strong line. And so the actions then are all, what are we doing about that? So by maintaining posi um, positions on those boards, by by advocating uh, our position, um, I think that's, hopefully that's pretty clear um, if we were to adopt this goal and that objective. Um, and then there is that action going on, um, the, the Ruckelhouse GMA roadmap project, what I just learned is it's, it's not about roads, it's about a potential evolution of GMA. Mm -hmm. And so we would want to be part of that because we feel that that urban boundary mm -hmm. uh, is very important to us. So let's, you know, the objective says, let's, let's, let's maintain that. This is what we're going to do about it. Here are our partners uh, and, you know, our, and here are our status. Um, what I don't have is, again, we just heard from Bob a little bit more status uh, on the Ruckel House roadmap project. But right now, you know, the only other status is we've got those positions. We know we're working on the framework update, and that's kind of detailed in the in the next objective that's down there. But I, I'm I'm just curious from both of you, um, you know, how much as a as an entire subject, as an entire objective, the objective, the actions, our partners, and our status. How is that, how are you with that first one, a strong urban growth boundary? It's, it's fine. It's essentially extremely similar to what was in the earlier um, draft. Okay. It just, and it's the original object objective was maintain integrity of the existing urban growth area. Um, and so I think, um, That's, I mean, that's fine. Yeah, I think, um, okay. yeah, I don't have any problem with that. And then the second objective says uh, retain Issaquah's access. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm good. Okay. Retain Issaquah's access to regional transportation funds. So that is a direct, uh, almost too, maybe too direct. I've been wondering if maybe this is too direct because there's been quite a few comments recently on GMPB about just updating that framework. Um, um, if you listen to some of the talk, everybody's just wanting to make sure they don't lose access to funds. But then every once in a while, a voice will come out and say, you know, we're really also trying to manage growth, right? They're, they're, we, uh, it's more than just managing access to funds. And I think that's a very important um, uh, thing to keep in mind. But this was just something very specific uh, that we had discussed because um, as I had mentioned, um, it, it appeared that through a framework update, you know, our, you know, our access could be limited. We are, the, our opportunities could be diluted. Uh, and, and, um, and so, I, you know, I'm proposing as an objective that we, you know, take a stand that we want to, you know, when it comes to the funds that we retain that access that we have today. Mm -hmm. So very straightforward. Um, and what I've been trying to do is report on what I see are the threats to that or not. Um, and so, and yes, you and I need to follow up on that as well, Stacy. Uh, but I don't know if there's any questions. I think, was that, I think, I don't think there was anything in the original version um, that was that specific. No, there wasn't. I did have a question on this one. Sure. We go back up to the goal which talks about We'll assume it's just an Issaquah's voice. You know, in Issaquah, okay. we want to minimize environmental impacts, more to economic prosperity, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. You go through all those. I'm not sure that retaining Issaquah's access to funding, transportation funding, is near as important as making sure Southeast King County gets funding. So the growth in Southeast King County is clogging up our city and making it really impossible for businesses on Front Street to get clients in the afternoon for people trying to get home. And so 
does it somewhere belong in here that we actually as a council should decide whether or not we want to advocate for someone else getting the dollars over us and who would that be? Because it's way more important to us to call the 18 and 90 and 18 and State Route 169 get done. That's the most important projects that could happen that would help us acquire right now. So that's not our funding. But that the benefit is this because the funding would actually be advocating to give the funding to, to regional partners who don't get funding now. And that's different than this. Mm. I'd rather be fighting to get them money than saying we need to keep access to money because the reason we have such a problem is because 80% of the traffic on Front Street is trying to go home to another urban growth area that's not us. And if you go back to the goal and you look at economic prosperity and all the rest of it, that's what's killing us. So we should be fighting for them to get money. So there's different uh, funding mechanisms uh, through PSRC. There's the regional money, and then there's what, then, there, then the, they give a big chunk of that. It's all federal money. It's, it's distributed regionally among growth centers. Mm -hmm. And then the balance of that goes to counties, and the counties then do their own um, kind of project evaluation and distribution of funds. Mm -hmm. So this, the intent, my intent with this one was has had to do with because of our status of having a regional growth center, it's the funds that are allocated for transportation projects related to those growth centers. And by the way, they don't they don't deal with the connectors or the corridors. Um, it's 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 things uh, directly associated with the growth centers themselves um, uh, that um, that are. Um, that are considered in that in that that regional that regional group of funds um, available just to growth centers. So the conundrum I see is that our regional growth center is clogged, and getting money for our regional growth center to move traffic around isn't going to do anything with the fact that it's already clogged. We can't build our way out of it. So I'm not sure what a great investment it would be to get money for Central Issaquah when it's flooded with people from other cities. Yeah, I just, that's not even going to help people move. I mean, that's one of our issues with growth, is there's growth going on everywhere, and there's a lot of it going on in Southeast King County, and they're driving through town, and we can't move. And so somehow, somewhere in here, we have to address the fact that we need to advocate for that. And I, I'm not sure that getting, I'm not sure what, maybe that's a good goal, maybe there's our objective, maybe something's missing, I don't know. Maybe there's, like maybe a, there's one missing. Maybe there's a second one. That's what I mean. That the second one. Uh, maybe this one, because I think um, what this is getting at is the, like Paul said, it's the money that Issaquah um, would compete for um, as its status, but there's a different, potentially a different objective that addresses what you're talking about. Yeah, and I want to recently. So the and Paul, sorry, when you're, I assumed <clears throat> that this retain Issaquah's access to regional transportation funds had to do with the, just like you said there, regional centers framework to make sure that it wasn't changed so it was not advantageous to Issaquah. That's right, especially yeah. disadvantaged because the yeah. the the growth center that we have has created a lot of capacity, mm -hmm. and and you know the way the laws work, concurrency works, and all of that. There is, um, um, I I think the threat to Issaquah is that the the capacity, um, you know. Um, the landowners to start start doing decide or they want to do something, and yet our whole plan and the EIS and the whole model that we had for the central area um, was does hinge on in fact we get a um, transportation mobility infrastructure within the central area to make that work. It, right, and so the and to the um, if if if. If, if that gets diluted or the opportunities for that, you know, um, go away, then I think that puts us in a real risky situation. Yeah, and that's uh, something we've been talking about for a couple of years, and that's kind of what I've assumed that you meant here. And that, so part. that is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the framework part of it. <clears throat> um, 
So I, I heard the, actually thought Mary Lou laid out kind of a new objective uh, to work with the South King County communities. And so that would certainly fit within the goals that we have. And after I watched the CIC meeting last week and the Hobart, it's a Hobart conversation that you had. And um, following that, one of the <clears throat> conversations I had with the mayor, we've had kind of a loose, I wouldn't say it's a stronger than loose, but a coalition of communities, Snoqualmie and others, Maple Valley, that you talked about at the meeting that night that we've worked together, but maybe we need to do something more formal, like uh, an interlocal agreement that kind of sp spells out uh, the policy objectives that all of us have, that we'd be able to work with the legislature and the regional um, partners mm -hmm. that we have uh, that would be something adopted by the council so it would be more formal than kind of the informal arrangement that we've been working on. And so if you did, you know, if you identified that as a new objective, you could uh, easily flow within that, still actually maybe get it done in 2017. Um, or at least beginning of eight, get the process started in 2017, get, get it done by 2018, if you wish. Um, but I'd leave it to Mary Lou, because it was your suggestion. Yeah, That's kind of just what I heard. It's helpful, Bob. Thank you very much, actually. So I don't, is this um, our 2017 or 2018 agenda? Because I was just to say, <laughs> if we're gonna revisit this in the fall, <coughs> we'll just leave an edit till then. Like if we're gonna do a 2018 agenda, just leave it till then. Well, I, um, I had a, I had a conversation with Paul about 2017, 2018, and um, I was going to speak to that later. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's kind of late in the year to have a 2017 <laughs> regional agenda. But but um, but I I can speak to that later. Okay. Pass on it. Okay. Um. Then. So I guess the next, can I, are you ready for me to move on, Paul? Yeah, we talked about the third objective. Um, you've shared your comments yep. about that. Yep. The school siting, so this was added in the original one. And um, it may have been in a different uh, category, so I think it got moved over to really? the lane. Yeah. My comment would be it seems uh, a little odd. I don't know. The only word that comes to mind is, is disingenuous, but I don't think that's fair um, because I don't know where this was initially. Uh, let me see. I don't know. It Maybe I did see it earlier. Um, but is this, how is this a, how is school siting within Issaquah a regional agenda item? Uh, so a couple reasons. One is that um, so under the GMA, we're required to work with the school district uh, as a city to help them find uh, schools within the urban growth boundary. And so um, it seemed as though you know the county has kind of given us that direction as well, that uh, partnering with a regional partner, which is a school district uh, in this case, to help them locate their schools fits within the, that concept of the regional agenda. And then we've already taken some steps along that. So amending the zoning codes, which actually we've done this year. Um, uh, and we had that first meeting with the council and the school board last year as part of that process. So a lot of this is already, at least some of the back work is done. I think this the second phase of this school setting within Issaquah, if this is a 2018 one, I'd be a much more stronger action verb to you know, assist them in actually locating sites within the city that makes that makes sense. So can I add? That? Yeah, yeah, please. Sorry, I was holding my breath for a long time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I had a conversation with Jim Haney today. Um, he called asking uh, whether or not we are uh, compliant with RCW uh, 3670A 150. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at RCW 36A 150, 3670A 150, um, it's, uh, it's basically planning lands for public purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you read that, it talks about 
identifying properties that are appropriate for, and it ranges anywhere from transportation corridors to utility corridors to sewage treatment plants to schools um, and other things. So there's a bigger laundry list. And so maybe, maybe what this is, and, and so when I talked to Kristen, Trish was out today, so there might be another layer to this conversation, but it does not appear that our comprehensive plan um, is addresses that. Right. Um, and so maybe what this should be is to actually add that to our comp plan. Um, and then the question is, is what regional public lands would we want to include in that new map if we're going to create a new map? Um, so I interesting conversation. It just kind of unfolded today, um, but this looks like a very small subset to something we might otherwise need mm -hmm. to be doing anyway that we may not be doing right now. So. I think it's beca I think it's because I asked the question whether the city's complying because <laughs> there was an assertion made a couple, three, four weeks ago that the city may not be complying. Um, so the it also could be as simple as providing lands that could accommodate schools and so is there CFF zoning? It could be as simple as that. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to it. So, um, so I think when I look at this objective, it kind of seems like the regional objective is not school siting within Issaquah. If it's within growth management, the objective to be something more like um, planning for more compact schools. And then the ways that we do that would be, you know, codes and um, so it seemed like this was, um, I guess the reason it seemed odd was it be, it's because it was very, 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 very specific about what our objective is, and I think our objective is broader than that. Right, Lou? Yes, I was going to say the same thing. I think some of the things are just in the wrong columns. I like what Stacy just said about citing compact schools or developing compact schools. But I think actually the status is that we've done a step, which is to amend the zoning code, and then... Um, but some of the other action steps ought to be the comprehensive plan language, but it also sought, ought to say something in there about um, this near-term need. There's a, site, a, a need for citing four schools ought to be in there, so that's right in front of us. And then also um, the last stage, which would be citing schools for the remaining zoning capacity we have in town, which we never, ever, ever talk about, which is the 11,000 houses that aren't here yet. So that's kind of what I think should be on here under the uh, action side. And then the amending zoning code moves over to that's a completed action, step in the right direction. Yeah, I agree with what I've heard. Uh, the um, Bob put this one in, so so <laughs> I didn't come up with this one. How convenient! Yeah, oh. <laughs> um, and uh, so I, I, I didn't. You know, obviously we, we did talk it through, but uh, I, so I do appreciate it. And I remember asking the same question and I had forgotten, Bob gave his answer a moment ago about because of the context within GMA and the county, and this is something we should be doing as a as a, as a city planning under GMA. But uh, I think the, the, the suggestions I've heard this evening about the objective and actions and where we are, maybe even broadening some of those objectives uh, makes sense, especially in light of the conversation, Keith's comments and Mary Lou's other point about further planning as well. I agree with those comments. Okay. Um, so the next one, preserve open space within and around Issaquah. Um, so the comment I had on this objective is that, um, isn't this what we just do as part of our work plan all the time? Yeah, it's a, core, some, it's a core value. Yeah, is, this yeah. There, is there some special, other than considering King County having a conservation levy next year that we're currently tracking, all of this seems like this is what just what we do all the time, which is why we get such high marks when we do our surveys about our parks and open spaces. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out why this would even be on here because it's, to me, the regional agenda should be items um, of considerable note that are over and above what we normally do on our work plan, that these are special emphases for some reason. Mm -hmm. So the compact schools, clearly they're, clearly it's, a, it's an issue. This just seems like preserve, this is what we do. We do it well. That was my comment. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
I don't know about the threshold. It has to be over and above. I mean, it's it should be comprehensive as well. If it's something that has a regional element to it, and um, uh, kind of per that test as well. If I'm out there as a representative of the city, maybe I'm uh, I, uh, in some formal, informal capacity, you know, um, you know, talking about a potential conservation levy, for example, because we know that's coming, and we could say, hey, you know, that's because my council has considered this. It is our goal to do this. You know, I may be in a position as a spokesperson for the city in my official capacity, you know, to say something in support. And this regional agenda is is the one that gives me that justification. So. Um, I kind of knitted that together. I don't know a lot about the conservation levy next year. Uh, I know uh, at this point, um, and and I think and I'm going to look to you again, Bob. I mean, you had some awareness of this coming and felt that we should take a position because. And I guess maybe Jeff is involved. I don't know, uh, but you felt strongly that this is something that we should have a position on at this point. Yeah, well, there's certainly, so Jeff has been involved. The uh, county's come to our uh, county manager's meetings uh, a couple of times to give us updates on this. Um, there's a couple things. One is, uh, it, so it's not just buying kind of the standard open spaces that uh, we typically see, like right outside our boundary or uh, within the city. Um, but it's also, uh, one of our arguments has been, are there opportunities for open space within the city or within our existing parks at some of that conservation levy uh, or expanding our existing parks that that conservation levy could be used for. And so a lot of uh, the county thought hasn't been around partnering with uh, cities specifically on um, expanding or building off of uh, kind of the converse, you know, building off city uh, park structure and infrastructure. It's been, you know, usually we take a look at how we can uh, utilize our existing infrastructure to better access the county or the state lands that already exist as open space within um, the community. So um, we certainly wanted to be at the forefront of the conversation with the county on looking at potentially buying properties outside of the city or within the city, but also looking at how that conservation levy may be used to enhance better um, our existing urban park system. Um, so it's tentatively scheduled for 2018. This is a 2017 regional agenda. Um, what I've heard from both of you, I, I just don't see that this has a place on our regional agenda. Just because of the year? Yeah. Oh. No, not just because oh. of the year. Okay. I mean, I, I, um, I think there needs to be some special reason that it's on our regional agenda, and just be you know, like you, like you said, Bob, it is a core value. Yeah. Um, and I just see that everything that's written on here would be everything that I would expect the administration to be doing anyway. So. Um, and I'm sure you do, and I'm, and there may be some reason to add something about parks and open or open space in a future regional agenda. I just don't see the, um, I don't think it belongs on here. So I have a question for Mary Lou. So you've used the test before about, hey, I'm out there and I want to know, I want to advocate for a city's position. So this is, sounds to me that this, uh, conservation levy concept is still in formation. So I, um, I'm just curious how you view um, it being in an agenda. Forget about the timing for it. I mean, just being part of our agenda now or in the future, something like this being in the agenda uh, because something is in formation and we're tracking that. Does it fit within that test that you have about, hey, I'm out there and I, I want to, it would be more clear for me um, on how to advocate for or against something because it's in the agenda? That's a, that's a good question. So when I look at this, again, I'm putting on my hat like I'm a brand new council member. I think even as a new council member, I, I might know that we already do this as well. I mean, I think for a lot of people who live here or serve on commissions or sit on council that we do know we do this. That doesn't mean I think it should come off necessarily, but I also think this whole thing about timeliness matters. And so if there's something that's com coming next year and there's an opportunity in January to you know, have a work session where we go through our 2018 uh, regional agenda, and maybe it belongs then. I just don't have strong feelings on it tonight, whether it should stay on or not. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's, there's a lot of things that we do that aren't on this agenda. 
regionally <laughs> as well. Um, I don't know. I just don't have strong feelings on this one at all. It can stay. It could move to next year. How are we? How could we be out advocating or not advocating for a conservation levy that's still in formation? <coughs> the council wouldn't have had an opportunity to take a position on. So uh, I'll try and take an initial crack. So right now the county administration has a work group put together that they're working. So it's really kind of the staff at the staff and administrative levels. And then at some point they'll come up with uh, recommendations that would go to the executive and get presented to the King County Council. So having input now from the council is beneficial, but ultimately, you know, the council, if it chose to, wanted to endorse or not endorse the levy at some point down the road, that would certainly be within the purview of the council too. comments on that one? Yeah. yeah to your last point, um, I, I see your point, and uh, maybe I'm wrong. I, I, I was under the impression, Bob, that this is still in formation. Uh, what is that, you know, is there going to be a levy? And if there is a, a levy proposal, uh, what's it going to say? And what would be the benefit to the our region and, and to Issaquah? Um, and, um, and you said earlier, Let's, we have a chance to be in front of this, try to help shape uh, that language. Maybe it should be written different, I don't know, because this doesn't help us participate that way um, you know, from, a, from a council's perspective. So, so um, from a, you know, maybe, maybe there is a, a milestone that has to be achieved. Something has to reach a certain level of formality, then it rises to the level of being on a council's regional agenda and maybe this isn't there yet. I'm, 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 those are questions, I don't, they're not rhetorical. Next one, advocate. I had a, question, a comment on the next one, I okay. think. Um, so by the second objective, <laughs> A, advocate for, Again, I think what I had hoped to see here would be what policy and what practice are we trying to change so that I'm a council member and when the issue comes before whatever group I'm on, I know. It's very general in the description of the objective. It's even more general in the description of the action plans. Um, and then when you get to the status, it talks about participating in the county effort to review the countywide regional road network. So again, I don't know what we're advocating for if we participate in it. So the reason I didn't even try and give suggestions on this one was because it seemed, not that it seemed inappropriate, but it seemed overly broad. And whatever should be on here, you, we should be, council members should be able to look at it and say, okay, you know, I'm filling in for toll on whatever he's on, GMP something. <laughs> um, I, and they're gonna talk about this and I know Issaquah's position on it and I didn't get that out of this. So I'm thinking that for this year it could just come off, but it could be further, further um, broken out in a 2018 one where it's clear what policy we're trying to change, what practice and what we're trying to change it to because that I didn't really get out of here. So that's why I didn't, I didn't a lot of edits in there at all. So next year, I think uh, when we look at 2018, so uh, when this originally got put together, it was more of a kind of a scorecard and you could go through and have the action yeah. staff and check it, check the boxes. And then now it's more, uh, there's a lot more philosophy and general policy within it. So. Um, and so maybe it's the different perspective. So council is more focused on the general policy and, the, and so we always kind of take more of the, and the administration side, the more specific objectives. Um, so I think this was a goal to kind of manage or incorporate the both. So maybe we just missed on this one a little bit in terms yeah. of. And I think actually, I think it's important. I just don't, uh, just think maybe it needs more work and maybe it's something we could fix for next year. Question. So the county effort to review the countywide regional road network, is that, is that the objective of the RTSI? Yeah. Yes, it is. Okay, so that's ongoing. Yep. It's ongoing right now. Now that will end at some point. Uh, I think it's supposed to end here in the first, either this last quarter, but more than likely the first quarter of next year. The RTSI conversation, there'll be some type of final report generated. Um, that'll go back to all the various communities. I think 
there's another elected officials meeting here planned for sometime at the end of the year too. Yeah, so yeah, I'm, I didn't put this in here. I don't know why. Uh, so I'm not really the city's representative on that. I think there, you've got a whole staff approach to this. I think Sheldon and other members of his group are part of our yeah. PSI. I think it relates back to the two bullets. So the amending PSRC policies to further emphasize regional growth impacts and lobby GMP. Yeah, but this is at the county level. I mean, the action. So the administrator, you, you, you talked about something actionable, um, you know, from the yeah. administration. So RTSI. It is right now. It's not. It's not even in the purview of uh, PSRC, or right. or even probably not even uh, the uh, Planning Council (GMPC). So the what this is again? It's to strengthen regional policies and practices related to growth and transportation that benefit the state of Issaquah. So one of the mm -hmm. the focus uh, focuses of the RTSI is to really say, let's look at the regional road network. There is no mechanism for funding that through the existing structures that we have at uh, you know GMPB or PSRC. Um, is there another alternative way to gener generate revenues that would pay for the regional road network that we all own uh, and have uh, costs and benefits from, but there is no, no owner necessarily of those roads, uh, even though the costs are spread, uh, you know, spread amongst all the communities. So um, that was one of the things I think that we anticipated when the mayor did his kind of regional task force on traffic and then with the county exec's appointment of RTSI was, all right, can we develop a regional policy or regional uh, practice related to uh, transportation on a regional basis uh, for the regional road network, which isn't being done right now? <clears throat> yeah, so this is where, um, so two things. One is because we have to explain it so much, it tells right. me that we probably don't have quite the right words right. here. <laughs> but this is where I would have thought to see something. The county surprised me, just the county effort on its own, but now I realize why. Because this to me might be where um, Issaquah would be advocating for those other projects. Like the big ones for us is really State Route 900, if that's a way to get around town, and 18 and 90, and 18 and 169. and. Um, those are the ones that would take pass through traffic and put it somewhere else. And then as we grew in our center, people wouldn't be saying we can't handle it because there would be a way for that traffic to get to Southeast King County. So maybe somewhere in here is when we hash this out, that's where that piece belongs. I thought the county piece was mis mismatched, but now I see it's just another group of regional roads. Yep. So, okay. Well, another comment. Thank for your comments, uh, Bob, as well. The, I think you're referring to something that really hasn't congealed within the city, in the council, or, or in the administration yet. This idea that there's a blind spot uh, in how the region and the county and the cities do its, you know, transportation planning. And and um, I think this is you know we we wondered if RTSI was going to maybe be the genesis maybe take that to this next level. Um, my assessment is it's not because for the very reasons I mentioned earlier because PSRC is we're not we're not doing anything there it's not going to go there probably uh, and it hasn't really come up at all at PSRC I haven't you know, there's really no um, um, issue in front of us where, you know, that's a question we can be discussing at, um, at GMPB either. So I think this conversation, I, I like the concept, but it does need, I think it needs a lot more development. Okay. Should, should you want me to delete it as a group? 2017. I don't know. Okay. Um, the other area where this could come up in conversation in terms of regional road networks that are um, overloaded um, is in the GMA framework discussions because mm -hmm. um, there have been comments about you know, the growth in silos did not um, address what would happen to connect those mm -hmm. the growth in those silos. So that's another area where that conversation could come up. So I don't, I, I'm not proposing it to be in that. That when we um, talked about the um, tracking legislation. 
um, that's one area we'd want to look at. We want to track. Okay. I'm sure we want to track all of it. It's related to GMA, but I think I think that's a good point. Okay, housing. Do you want to move on to housing now? Okay, this one's shorter. Okay, so the goal, max, maximize availability of housing at all affordability, affordability levels in Issaquah and across King County. Um, so my, yeah, so my comment about the goal and adding across King County, um, it, um, um, not sure the goal works for me unless we look at the fact that we partner with Arch on regional housing, and so then we m made a goal that fit that, that that partnering with Arch fit under. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not sure that, and I understand. I, I don't know how maybe somebody else can say it better. But I'm not sure that our regional agenda has to do with helping the region as much as it is our our work in the region. We hope to help us here. That's with that too. So, um, and I think part of how we one way that we get. Um, more housing in Issaquah at different affordability levels is by virtue of the fact that we partner with Arch. So that since we are a partner in that, um, that by its nature helps the region, but then it also pays it forward here. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think across King County should come off. Um, and then the increase the supply of work, affordable and workhouse housing and workforce housing in Issaquah, develop and implement a housing strategy. The status of that is that is to adopt a work plan, right? Not the strategy itself. So far, that's the status, isn't that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. But I, it says the strategy to be scheduled for council action on October 17, but we have adopted yeah, the work plan. Yeah, we need to get plan. that updated. Yeah. 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 I had a couple of questions about that first one. And I guess um, it's actually between A and B. So for A, I proposed the language in red <coughs> because I thought there are there are three ways to get uh, housing affordability, mm -hmm. but increase is just one. Increase typically means new. And so I actually would like to see us uh, concentrate on three approaches, which is preserve what you have, enhance uh, where, you ha where you can, and then increase supply, which is new. So I'm not sure if we want to go with that. But the TOD to me actually belongs under the increase. It's actually an action to me. I think the TOD project is, new affordable mm -hmm. workforce housing. And so rather than have it have its own category, I'd just stick it up under, you know, mm -hmm. developing a housing strategy and um, work on this TOD project. I, I think it does, it's not an objective on its own necessarily. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Um. I want to say something about the goal. You moved on before I got a chance. So the you know, maximized diversity of housing. I agree that the as much might stop working. Well, I'm going to keep talking into it to see if it picks up. The, uh, oh, it doesn't. You don't have to talk into Mary Lou. Yes, sir. Just the bottom of the one on your. Let me see. Check. You have one on your right. There you go. Is that any better? Yeah. That one work again? This one won't even shut off now. The, we had the um, uh, 
trust fund workforce, uh, not workforce, excuse me, a task force uh, meeting a couple weeks ago. And uh, I think I shared with the, uh, in my, my report that there was the concept that was discussed that as, as members of that coalition, because it's a regional, um, ARCH is a regional coalition for housing, and that within that coalition that um, it seemed, I didn't know how to feel, about, I wasn't anticipating this question, and I wasn't sure exactly how I felt, but it was mentioned there, and it was echoed and supported by a lot of people participating in that particular meeting that um, that um, a win or improvements for affordable housing per ARCH's activities um, within anywhere within the coalition is a win for all members of the coalition. There seemed to be a strong sense that, yeah, if, if, if we participate participate in some, because we're part of ARCH, and maybe some of our trust funds go to something that happens in Kirkland, then that's also a win. Because that's a win for the region, that's a win for Issaquah. Um, that got some airplay. That was discussed in that meeting, and I wasn't really sure what to think about it, because it's not something we had ever discussed before, but I do want you to know that um, it's my recollection, and Emily may have some to add to this as well, because she was there, that a preponderance of the people there agreed strongly with that mm -hmm. contention. And it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And, and so this would be, I don't know if we want to fully revisit, you know, our participation in, in ARCH and what it means to us as a city. But um, if, we, if we do believe that, then I think finding some way of starting, stating that within the goal um, would be appropriate. So again, I think that's a good conversation to have. I mean, do we, does the city look at uh, accomplishments, successes that ARCH has with anywhere within the coalition as success for us as well. And if we did, then it could say something like maximize or increase or whatever, the availability of housing at all affordable levels uh, in Issaquah and within the, you know, the ARCH coalition or something like that, instead of across King County. As I know, I've heard, I've heard Arch and Arthur say a number of times, and I've heard other cities echo this as well, it's kind of like, because of our relationship and part of that coalition, it's like, we do not have a housing department. They are like an extension of our staff. They provide a lot of that housing work. Uh, and, 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 and for all the members of the coalition, except maybe King County, they have their own, but, and, and maybe Bellevue has some as well. But the other cities are very, uh, I've heard many times repeat that, yes, Arch is, they, they're an extension of us. They're 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 like our housing department. That's how we use them. So oh, no, no, I don't disagree with any of that any of that at all. Okay. And if it didn't benefit us, we wouldn't be a, a partner in Arch. So I think the fact that it benefits us um, is um, is known. And I don't think uh, anybody would say that. Um, uh, increasing housing in other areas of the county is a win for the coalition. I think that's true. But um, I don't think that um, our region, I don't think that across, I don't think that that is part of our goal here. Part of how we get more affordable housing in Issaquah is because we're a partner in Arch, because Sometimes they, Arch spends money elsewhere and sometimes it spends it here, but we wouldn't get any of Arch's money spent here if we weren't part of the coalition. Um, so I think it's one of the actions. I don't think it's part of the goal. Yeah, I'm not really in support of and across King County. I, I'm not sure that's why we were elected to sit in the, the chairs here. I think, I think being part of Arch, we do get a benefit and the region benefits, all the partners benefit when it's built anywhere. But we need it in town, and, and this goal is to get it in town. This is what we're doing, is we need to increase our stock because we are far below our targets. We are really lacking in the 30 to 60 percent AMI. And so I would feel very uncomfortable if in the next 10 years we supported ARCH and every single ARCH project was built somewhere else. I wouldn't feel like we lost. I would feel like the region won and ARCH's partners won. But we made no progress towards our own personal responsibility here in this city to make our housing stock diverse. 
And so I, I wouldn't want to see, I'm not supportive of leaving in Cross King County. In there. Okay, and I, and I was proposing a change to that as well. I was uh, proposing something that kind of picked up our participation in, in the in the coalition. It is, uh, and and, I, and I'm reminded as well. This conversation reminds me that um, to have a regional agenda is about, um, I think, it is about outcomes for Issaquah. But we cannot um, be. It can't only be about Issaquah. There has to be benefit to the region. Um, and it may come from it. something that happens within Issaquah is a benefit and can be a benefit to the region. But I think to get the collaboration and to get the um, you know uh, it's you know there has to be benefit to the partners that we're working with as well for whatever stat uh, uh, position that we have. And I think that I think that's important message that with our regional agenda that our partners within the region understand that we're working for the better of of Issaquah and the region. Uh, and this is this is a, a list of, of, of strategies and goals, um, uh, really, you know, for the benefit of Issaquah and and the region. And so stating it, in, you know, someone, you know, could read this, and so they understand this is not just, you know, Issaquah is trying to be a good partner within the region as well. So that's why I would advocate for having comments like this in there, especially because we already are part of a coalition. It's in there. It's just under actions, not goals. We, so the goal, we want more affordable housing in Issaquah. What's our objective? We want to increase something, and how do we do that? Well, we do it by creating a housing strategy to figure out how we're going to get there. We do that by partnering with Arch, because we will get housing here by virtue of that. That happens too. You know, I, mean that, I think that shows that we're partner in the region. So, oh, thank yeah. you. I understand yeah. that you don't agree with me. I've made my point. If you don't agree with it in the goal, you've already said that I've made my point. So thank you. So, all right. So I think we got these two covered. I heard you guys, the suggestion that B yeah. get moved up into this upper box. And then... Um, Forget all the rest. Okay. Your comments. They're yeah. done. You address them. Okay, Thanks. thank you. <laughs> Probably should get the comments removed in the. the yes, yeah, I'll yeah, take yeah, them yeah, out yeah, when okay. we. Uh, yep, yep, I got yes. that note on there. Okay. So, <coughs> so it's tentatively scheduled to come back on the 16th, which would give me enough time to circle back <laughs> with the chair and get this kind of finalized uh, for the final one. And then, did you want to talk about 17 and eight versus 18? Um. Well. <coughs> um. Yeah, I think um, <coughs> I already mentioned this to Paul. Like I said, we talked about it briefly one time, and it seems to me like we're such a you know by the time the council adopts this, it's mid October, and um, we it, it it seems that we should be adopting an ad an agenda for the following year in October, November, December. Um, and so um, I had mentioned to Paul, it seems like you know, there didn't seem to be any rush um, for this to be finished. Um, I mean, the whole regional agenda. And so maybe, um, you know, the idea that this, um, you know, do we adopt one for 2017 or we just wait for, you know, do one for 2018? Um, and then um, I heard from Paul, which I also ag agree with that, um, and Paul can state it, but he can, um, but what I heard that I agree with was, well, these things aren't just, they're not just bookends. Like you have, you have items that you want to work on regionally and they're not just starting at the beginning, you know, January 1st and ending on December 31st. They're, they're ongoing rolling efforts and I totally get that. Um, um, but I don't know that we, by delaying something and adopting a 2018 agenda, does that mean that we're not going to work in, on any of these? And I'm, uh, I think not. Um, it just makes more sense to me to begin working on a 2018 regional agenda. Um, and the, the second comment I have is, I think we have really struggled with this this year. Um, I think um, um, we're, we're talking about what kinds of things belong here. I'm not sure we've really well defined, the council has not really well defined what should be on a regional agenda. Um, and 
you know, what, what's regular work plan stuff and what should be on a regional agenda, what, what's the difference? Um, and I think we need some work. I think we need some work on that. And then my third comment is it, um, it needs to be a usable document, not just something that gets adopted every year and we don't really use it except to say we have a regional agenda. So I want it to be, I want it to be meaningful. I don't want it to just be an empty exercise that we all debate for a while about what should be on here. Um, so I have some concerns about that. Those are my comments. Yeah, if I may, I agree, especially with those that last point. It, 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 it can't be empty. That's the whole point is for better outcomes for Issaquah and therefore for the region. And having uh, and knowing that we can't do everything uh, and we have to direct our resources in a way that's policy driven. Um, uh, and this was a way to do that. I think uh, the, um, the timing of it is uh, um, questionable. Yeah, I, I think, Stacy, you've asked a couple good questions, and maybe that's the kind of things we need to refine. Maybe we need to uh, spend some time kind of talking about uh, let's make distinctions between regular work plan items and what should be on the regional agenda. I think we, well, part of it is we haven't really formally ident identified all of those, and we're having we're coming at some of these with different. Um, uh, perspectives because we're not starting from the same place on what we're trying to do. Um, I, I would, I, I think we should move this um, in the status that it's, uh, if we can finalize this and, 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 and I'd, I'd like to see us take action. I think the things that are in here are meaningful. Uh, I think the next time we come back with that, with some um, clarification on um, these these open questions in general about the agenda and what we're trying to do and what's the purpose. Mary Lou's talked a number of times as she puts on the hat of of like a, of a new council member coming in. I mean, that's one perspective. It's not the only perspective, but I think it's a good way to, th to think about it, about um, the material that goes along with the, with the agenda, and I think we should have conversations about that to make this even better, but I think we should go forward um, and, and bring this back to full council for consideration uh, for adoption, and then, um, and then the next tasks would be finding ways to make it even better, to take the lessons that we've learned through this process uh, and improve the process next time. I'm fine for 2017 to just go ahead and move with whatever edits that Bob does. I, I'm i still not entirely sure we figured out what this is supposed to be yet. Um, I don't know, I don't think the process we used this year was very effective in getting us all through it and getting us all on the same page. So maybe just a suggestion to think about what next year might look like. Um, is this a meeting in December to talk about next year? So. In the first quarter, we actually have it, and we, we have all of our existing and new council members sort of educated on it at the same time. But um, I, have, I still have a lot of reservations that we haven't clearly articulated what our positions are on these to others who might read this, to council members who sit now and council members that might come. And the only reason I worry about that is effectiveness in the region. Uh, we have to have our council all out in the region with similar talking points. And I think I said before, City of Sammamish does something like this and then they have their talking points card that they go with. And they can present a pretty unified voice out in the community if they've talked it through. And I'm not sure this gave us that kind of cue card that we could all go to an SCA dinner and hear about an issue and weigh in with our support or our concerns in a, in a similar manner. So I guess we'll get there, but I'm fine if you want to move it ahead to this year. Adopt it, 2017, that's okay. Bring it to council, I'm fine with that. I'm fine moving it forward. And um, I'm, um, I'm not sure I'm going to support it because I'm, I have concerns, um, like I already said, um, my concern that I'm, con and I am concerned about um, the content and adopting something that, I mean, if we're gonna adopt, adopt something, we should, you know, I wanna be able to support it and, and um, and I'm not sure that the regional agenda is um, 
I don't even know how to say it, Consist consistent with what we were aiming to do. Um, I'm beginning to really like the idea of something that's um, very short and states our positions um, and that maybe they're not year specific. Um, I'm beginning to like that idea because I think it does um, allow us to be, if, if council members want to be out representing us or if we are out rep representing the city, um, we have to find the regional agenda, find out what our position is. Um, and I, I, I don't know, it may, be, it, may be very, it may be too specific. I'm, so I'm a little uncomfortable with, still with this. Um, it's not that I don't like the idea. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do about it, but I do want to bring it forward. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other discussion on this? No, Are we thanks. done? Okay. Well, last item on our agenda: Agenda Bill 7342, Architectural Fit and Urban Design, and this is regarding the development moratorium. And we have Lucy Sloman, Land Development Manager. And I think we also have some special guests that might be helping us tonight. Special yes, guests. please. Um, I'd like to invite them up to the table, um, if that's okay. Sure. Um, Kevin Price and Mel Morgan. Mel is uh, the vice chairman of the Development Commission, and Kevin Price is one of our newer members, and he's an architect and has um, brought some valuable perspective to that. Um, if it's all right with the committee, I um, suggested that they maybe wanted to make opening comments, um, and then I could um, do my brief presentation. <laughs> Great. <coughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being willing to come to Meeting. Sure, we're excited. <laughs> yeah. I've never sat down here before. Oh. <laughs> this is fun. We're up there. It's way more fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I hadn't um, necessarily planned on presenting. I've been scribbling down some thoughts. Um, but uh, I'm just going to read them to you for, for, it was mostly a, a way for me to gather some thoughts, but uh, I'm just going to read uh, sort of what I think we've been trying to do uh, to create our, our design review guidelines. Uh, so, so what is good design and what is right for Issaquah? I think that's fun, fundamentally what we've been driving at and what we've been trying to create. It's a tool to help us define that. Um, so design, as we all know, is very subjective. What's appealing to one isn't appealing to another, and understandably so, and, and so it should be. I think it's that diversity in uh, perception that, that can make a place special. Um, so what we have endeavored to do is create, like I said, a tool, a set of guidelines uh, that provide us, uh, us, the commission, the designer, the applicant, the staff, and I think almost most importantly, uh, a tool for the public, um, a common framework that, that is a touchstone, it's a place to start from that isn't so subjective. Um, I think it really gives the public a framework to help establish a mindset, moreover. You know, but they, they just see development happening, and um, I, I don't think they always understand what's behind it, even though a lot does go into it. Um, so, so I think if you have this tool, I think, I think it provides uh, also a framework for the community to define what is good and what is bad. Um, and, and, and again, it, it creates a mindset um, versus uh, everything is an option. And I think that's what everybody thinks. Uh, so this, this puts some constraints on that. Um, I often say things get better when constraints uh, are placed on uh, a given problem. It, f it forces one to uh, look closer at how to solve the problem. Um, so in a combination of work with the consultant, the staff, ourselves on the commission, uh, we work closely to define the identity of Issaquah and uh, create a manual that helps facilitate that identity. Uh, development is going to happen, that's inevitable. But I think we must find a way to preserve what we think is important about ISQA and find a way to carry that notion forward. Uh, it's going to evolve, going to evolve. Our values as a community will hopefully evolve. Uh, but, but again, this, this tool may help facilitate uh, that evolution. Um, so 
you know, a lot of these ideas uh, that um, came out of um, the, the consultant are new ideas, uh, but I think uh, they're specifically tailored to Issaquah, and they work very closely with us to help define what that is. And so I think we've done a good job uh, to get to a place uh, that defines some distinct styles. Uh, it may be 20 years before you see this take shape, but I think in the end, you're gonna create a special community that has identity, and, and it's, uh, it's a good thing. So I'm proud of the work we've done, and uh, I welcome your questions and feedback. Well, thanks for allowing us to be here and help out, um, especially since we're helping build our own toolbox, so mm -hmm. we really appreciate it. Um, I guess just a few things. One, I view these really as starter guidelines uh, because I think they're going to have to be tried out and used for a bit and then come back and make changes to it because of how radical it is in terms of limiting the designs. Um, and I think it would be uh, imperative to do that soon and look at both what we get and what we don't get especially, things that can't make it into the city under these guidelines or into the the central core. Um, colors, um, I personally, I think they're too boring. Um, when I go through looking what they've come up with, and again, this is partly just my viewpoint, so largely just my viewpoint. Uh, arts and crafts, natural earth tones, craftsmen, natural warm earth tones, Northwest Lodge, natural warm earth tones, Western Fall, Falls Front, natural earth tones, soft, dull, or muted. Uh, Urban Grange, neutrals, black, white, gray, Northwest Revival, natural earth tones, and Northwest Contemporary, natural earth tones, white, gray, and black. So I go through, I'm very afraid that we end up with a very bland looking urban core. Um, and I think Randall Rambill has the idea that buildings should be more background mm -hmm. and what goes on at the street and with civic buildings should stand out. I don't know that I agree with that, so I think it'll be interesting to see what we do get and if we, I know that Atlas Blue is a dirty word, but um, <laughs> we may need something more. Um, and one other thing, I think urban core, I'm concerned about only having one style, the Northwest Contemporary and the urban core. There was a discussion about, should there be the ability to have uh, some bleed through or should there be a sharp line? And I think PPC decided to go with the sharp line and keeping only Northwest Contemporary. In the urban core, it's a big area, and to have just one single style that can be built in the urban core, I think will be limiting. Um, I think the Northwest Revival style may be a possibility to bleed into it. I'm not sure exactly how you do it on a one-off basis. I don't think it would just be on the edges themselves. It may have to be on a case-by-case -case basis, I'm not sure, but uh, that would be one of my concerns, so. And I have to say, Lucy, Keith, the whole staff have done a great job working it through this process and helping us try to figure it out in the Development Commission and the PPC and everything, so thank you. Do you have any questions for um, Kevin or Mel, Mel, or do you want to go through the presentation? And okay. So um, Mel and I served on the commission for a long, long time, and uh, we still talk about development when we see each other, which is interesting. And at one point, you and I talked about the Whistler development uh, and design guideline standards, and I think you had a look at them, uh, or a quick look at them, I thought, or an article. I was wondering if you'd actually taken any thoughts or ideas from there and suggested those for ours, or did you? I don't think I got a chance to go through the Whistler guidelines. Oh, okay. That might have been, maybe it was Joe, but. Might have been Joe. I don't think so. Okay. I, I do have some concerns. There, there are, um, I think some of the styles you would see there, I'm not sure how they would fit in some of these some yes. of these guidelines. Yes. Um, okay, that's okay. Yeah. Um, if you didn't have a chance to look at it, it's fine. Um, I don't think the style thing works at all, but they did have some general comments that I'll bring up with Lucy later mm -hmm. on, and there's having more to do with letting in natural light and, and thanks, Mel. Great, Lucy's you're welcome. Hey, Lucy. So good evening, Lucy Sloman, Land Development Manager. Um, <clears throat> so, 
I always start here because this is where we started. Uh, July 2016, we did our evaluation chiclet chart to start us off. Um, you know, I think uh, there was a general agreement that even though there was compliance with central Quest standards, there was disappointment um, in the results um, in terms of achieving the vision, had the moratorium, two work plan items, architecture and urban design. Uh, staff recommended combining those and hired uh, selected Crandall Arambula um, as our consultant. Uh, I, I just provide this partly because there has been a huge number of meetings and coordination both with the Development Commission who has been very generous with their time and also with the Council um, starting back in April. Uh, we've done, you know, assessments, components, outlines, styles, photos, then we went through the book um, in detail for several meetings. We did the test case at the Council's suggestion, which I think was really a great idea. Uh, looking at the Vail project, um, did a detailed uh, survey of, um, well, detailed with the commission. It wasn't like we went out to the world, but uh, uh, plus Connie, of course, and uh, looked at about uh, 35 or 40 buildings in Issaquah. That was really helpful to me. Uh, it, even if it didn't make it into the manual, that was uh, super um, uh, informative. Uh, we had the, uh, that was mainly in July, then August we went to the hearing. So here we are tonight, and um, uh, just to sort of start with where we are hoping to get to, this is the first of two land and shore meetings on this topic with the goal of, or at least the tentative schedule, of adopting October 16th. This is our kind of longest touch. Um, so um, there, mostly I think we're looking for feedback from you. There are a couple of items that we'll unpack a little bit at the end. Um, I'm gonna give a brief overview. Um, you know, in thinking about this, I think we've tried to extract some of the goals uh, that we have heard along the way or went into this with. Um, you know, we need a, t a tool that gets us um, a central, gets us closer to the central Issaquah plan vision. We need projects that fit in Issaquah. Uh, we want to regulate architecture, style, color, materials. Um, that was an intentional thing that we did not regulate um, to begin with, and we found that didn't work. Um, we need something that's user friendly for the development commission, for applicants, for staff, um, and the public. I think that's an excellent point. Um, clear, a lot of what I did was less trying to um, control form, uh, with the content, but look at are the terms consistent, are they clear, are they um, used consistently throughout the document. There were, so there was a lot of implementation pieces that um, I was focused on. And then also having a clear relationship how this works with other codes that um, have to integrate with it. And feel free for anyone to dive in at any time. So um, here's our brief overview. Elevator speech as I was asked for. <laughs> Two architectural uh, districts, urban core and traditional Issaquah. Urban core equals the zoning. Traditional Issaquah are the um, other zones in central Issaquah which are not urban core. So with each of these, there are select uh, architectural styles that are allowed. In uh, urban core, there is one, as um, both of the commissioners pointed out, that is Northwest Contemporary. Uh, that was an intentional uh, move on Crandall Arambula's part. They feel that that style was best suited for the intensity and density and to also make it distinctive so that as our regional growth center, um, the hub of our transit uh, and train in the future, that it would be distinctive. Uh, traditional Issaquah has originally had five and now has six styles. Um, starting at the top, uh, Arts and Crafts, Craftsman, Northwest Lodge, uh, Western Falls Front, Urban Grange, and Northwest Revival. These six styles are um, based on uh, buildings and styles from Issaquah, and that's why they call it eclectic historicism. Lucy, can I ask a question? Yeah. Absolutely. So can you talk a little bit about Northwest Revival and 
Um, that's, is that the new one? That's the new one, and at the end I have a, a okay. slide that unpacks that a little bit more, but, because absolutely that's new to you and, and it needs some unpacking. Um, each style has um, four components, massing, scale, materials, and color, as well as appropriate and inappropriate images. Urban design piece, we tend to focus on the architecture piece. Um, I want to spend just a little bit of time on the urban design piece. Um, unlike uh, the styles which are tailored to the districts and to a vision of the districts, the urban design applies across all districts and styles. And it, they've mainly grouped it into two categories. One is context and one is site. Context is both natural and built context of the project. Site is specifically the site um, that the project is going into. So natural context, um, with that there are additional design responses that are required when you're adjacent to certain features. We're gonna talk about what those features are. We think that's another piece that we'd like a little more council input on. Uh, built context, um, most buildings are meant to harmonize. Um, certain buildings are meant to stand out, and those are civic and cultural public buildings. Um, I, uh, I would say that no one has been terribly fond of the images they put in for their um, contrasting buildings, um, and uh, we've recommended using the library, which is one of the most popular buildings in the city, and then Fire Station 72. I think that it does stand out. <laughs> maybe not in a good way. Um, I just saw a facial expression. Um, but... Um, it was mine, I didn't mean anything. <laughs> okay. Um, but that, that there, we have good examples in the city of buildings that stand out that might not comply with all of the styles, and so why not use those if we think they're good buildings that reflect our community? Uh, in terms of site, uh, there are four main components and then a lot of details, and I'm happy to talk about any of these that you would like to, but mainly they focus on block size, block access, how you're getting into the block, um, either <coughs> as pedestrians or vehicles, um, block edges, um, setbacks, entries, um, ground floor uses, and transparency, and then usable open space. So those, so. Th for urban design, this is really the components that they have focused on. Um, we've asked about some of the other, there were a bunch of other things that we've asked them about. Um, more auto-oriented uses, uh, utilities, uh, services, and they've said, you know, those things are fine in Central Esquad. The things that they focused on are the things where they felt that there was more detail would really benefit us in achieving the vision that Central Isqua has established. All of it done through a checklist. Um, they've been using it um, at um, Council Members Winterstein's suggestion. We have talked to them. They are prepared to work with us this year. As buildings come in, staff would do the review and then have them sort of do a um, peer review to help train and educate us. We think that will be the most effective way to make sure that we are understanding their intent, not missing things, and so um, we've got that set up to take advantage of next year. A uh, couple of final details. Uh, one was um, earth tones. PPC asked for, er, they really loved the color wheel. Um, we think that was a, a good tool to help explain in a graphic sense um, how this worked. Um, it was a request from the city attorney who's been working with us on this. Um, this is my mock-up. I'm sure CA will do a much nicer job. Um, but just that CA said it's really the greens through orange would be the earth tones, not the hues, which are the outer ring, but the tints and tones that are the middle and inner ring. Um, and that the rest of the colors may come in as accents um, depending on the style, um, but earth tones would be the um, primary colors. The other detail I would um, point out is um, this, was, this document was built in InDesign 
and converted to Word, and it didn't work very well. Um, we are um, exploring uh, having someone rebuild it in Word. Um, I'm in contact with a couple of people. So th a lot of the things that are kind of wonky, um, format, page numbers, dates, um, I've gotten the final credits, uh, image credits. Uh, we will insert those two images, the library and the fire station, if those are acceptable to people. And then we need to finalize a map on the natural context areas once we agree on what that is. We'll rebuild that. So Northwest Revival Style, these are the two things we wanted to talk to you a little bit about. Uh, it's uh, Crandall Arambula had a higher minimum threshold of like five or six stories. In conversation with PPC and the Development Commission members who were in attendance at the public hearing, uh, the recommendation was minimum of four stories uh, and then maximum would be seven stories or whatever the maximum allowed would be. Uh, materials are masonry only. Now, I will say that we have already heard from one uh, person that this is a little off-putting. Um, that's probably um, in terms of cost. Off-putting. Off um, so, um, that's, but I have gone back to, to Crandall and Rambula, talked to them, they feel, they feel strongly about masonry. Of course. So Lucy, a couple of the pictures up there, which I think look really nice, are only two stories. And so if we're um, converting one-story retail and parking lots over a 20-year period, and somebody comes in and just wants to build a two-story building in the central area, they can't use... So the ones at the bottom? Yeah. So, I, sorry, I hadn't quite gotten through there. Yeah. Um, no, that's okay. Um, so those are pictures. Uh, so the reason I put those up there is, um, often there were buildings that we would all recognize that represented the style. The buildings at the bottom are Issaquah buildings that are in that style. So I put them up there simply to say these are examples of where um, this style comes from in a historical sense. Um, they are, uh, you know, I think we rec each recognize these buildings. This one in the middle, um, I spent a while on the uh, Isquah historical site, and that's this building as it was originally built, which I find fascinating. So um, it's not that this style couldn't work at two stories, um, but their, their recommendation, I think, was based on that they feel that we want more diverse styles, that the uh, Northwest Revival um, uh, at the lower scales may be deferred to too often and that we wouldn't get the kind of diversity, um, the more eclectic mix. Okay, so it's a, it was a slightly different question. Okay, sorry. It's, um, so, you know, the four to six story buildings that we're looking at here are likely several years, if not decades out. But the area that is transitioning currently has only one-story buildings. And so I know there's a, it's awkward when one of those wants to come in, like where the Denny site is, Corner Bakery, and, and stay at one level. But um, is the jump to minimums like four too big of a jump? Does it mean we stay with the one-story retail, even if it's 1970s vintage, until the performer makes sense to go to a six-story building or a four-story building? or? Why, why are we giving them a minimum of four? Because I would think a nice two or three story building would be an upgrade to one of the strip malls. So um, let me see if I can answer the question you're answer, asking this time. There are styles that are allowed that start at one story four. and up. Um, so uh, arts and crafts, craftsmen, Western Falls Front and Grange can all be used one story. They just top out lower. They top out at three or four stories. And so there definitely are styles that are available. Um, I think, uh, C A C and then that sort of ties into what I was saying before, is CA sees this as more appropriately used with buildings that are at least four stories tall rather than lower buildings, although you can clearly use it with lower buildings. If that makes sense, good answer. Okay. Um, roof is flat, uh, and then 
a big part of it is a really strong, detailed, interesting cornice. So those are the main components of uh, Northwest Revival. Any more questions about that one? Can you comment on the, the choice of, so Mel made the comment about um, just one in the urban core? Well, um, so again, um, this was really a CA's, Crandall Arambilla's recommendation, and I think, um, uh, I think that we're trying to follow the community and the desires of the community. So I don't think that um, when, when we pushed um, Crandall Arambula to come up with a six style um, and I had identified something trained as an architect, said, what about Chicago um, school architecture? And they said, that really is Northwest contemporary. So. Um, I think that if we want to have more a, a historical version and a contemporary version that could apply to the urban core, we could use both those styles. Because one is a contemporary version of Chicago school commercial style architecture and one is a more traditional version. Um, I think that their uh, approach was to have a more distinctive character between the two areas. Um, so the second uh, topic has to do with the natural context areas. I don't think anyone disagrees with it. Um, uh, we've known that there are these things that are, that these natural areas, it's a huge value of the city. It's a very important part of our character. Um, we felt like um, buildings are not uh, responding, you know, are not recognizing this the way we want them to. Uh, this is their original map. Um, in studying that, we realized that um, you know, this is the challenge of an outside consultant looking at things and evaluating it. Um, some is developable area that's already under construction that they've included um, that we would not say set aside for preservation. Uh, for instance, the gateway sites. We might have said that at some point, but oh, I see. that water is, that uh, <laughs> horse has left the barn. Um, and some areas down in this neighborhood uh, as well. Some of those are parks, some of them, I think they misread um, what was going on there. Uh, we also felt that hill, we looked at the hillsides, did a fairly detailed, um, had uh, Brian Overman in Public Works Engineering do a pretty detailed uh, slope analysis. Really all the slopes are on the edges. Um, and that we didn't feel that there was, um, we were gonna get really good benefit from trying to uh, orient buildings because there just was not enough slopes that were inside Central Issaquah uh, to uh, benefit from that. So, question on that side, sure. see if that's okay. Yeah. So that was a little confusing looking at it without hearing your explanation, so that was great. Um, one of the quick things I was looking for in the code was on the two parcels, it did get added in that have slopes on them, which would be um, one above Home Depot and the other one I think is where Innis, what's it called, Inniswood or, mm -hmm. yeah, Inniswood is going, was whether or not there was any architectural standards for blending a building into a hillside as opposed to using valley standards to build a structure on a hillside. Uh, somewhat. Um, I did look at some of the things that we had written for Isqua Highlands um, because we had had a hillside overlay and um, we did add some of those uh, to this which was making sure for instance um, downhill foundations uh, were screened. Um, the uh, both, well Inniswood is already you know, their land use permits approved. But the one above Home Depot is certainly an, an important test because that's gonna be a very visible site. Um, one thing was that they had focused primarily on wooded hillsides, which would not be that particular one. Um, and uh, a lot of it was to orient towards the um, kind of open space. 
And we wanted to make sure that what we were asking people to orient to was something worth orienting to. So I'm not sure, again, on that side that the hillside is really something that you want the building focused on. So um, in the, that's, I think, in the end why we, we sort of set that one aside, that we didn't feel that 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 was going to gain us something. Now, if you look at the Inniswood site, just for educational purposes, um, it's got steep slopes around it and some, uh, I think it's got some wetlands uh, as well. And those we have recommended be a part of the um, elements that would trigger this uh, natural context zone. Okay, so recognizing that it's only two parcels and one is under development, I still feel strongly that I would like to see a hillside overlay in this code, even though it's only one parcel. And I say that because it may be one of the most visible parcels we have in town, ever. <laughs> and more so than just the thought of orienting towards a natural feature, um, other communities that build on hillsides also limit the height of retaining walls and the material of retaining walls and give maximum cut fill balances so you're not ripping out a hillside to put a building in, things like that. So I think there's several aspects to a hillside overlay that you would look at, even though it's only one parcel. I just feel it's one of the most prominent parcels in town. So um, that's great. I, I think um, what we can put together for uh, Land and Shore next week is looking both at Central Issaquah and the other pieces um, that are in here that, you know, look at what we have and take your comments and say, is this giving us what we need or do we need to propose something else? Um, so the things, and I've got more detail on this. I'm just trying to focus on what you're interested in talking about. So what we're proposing, and I, and I just use this particular GIS uh, layer because it uh, represents some of the pieces that we're talking about. Um, the trigger, the things that would trigger the natural context zone would be regulated streams, regulated wetlands and their buffers, city parks, city open space, and then the private open space, um, which has got an NGPE and is mapped. So there are three different greens on this map, and that's what those, th those three things, city parks, city open space, space, and private open space are represented in those three greens. Um, the, the last piece was natural stormwater ponds. Um, they had really focused on things like pickering ponds um, as something that we would want buildings to relate to. Um, they had actually mapped all the stormwater ponds, and we think that there are ones such as the ones at <laughs> I love that watching your face. faces. Um, no one else gets to enjoy it the way I do. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are some stormwater ponds, such as the ones at uh, uh, Home Depot, which are, you know, there's no green space, there's, there's no landscape, and, you know, that's a site that we see redeveloping, and in, in its redevelopment, we would see that going away, and so we're not trying to set that aside and preserve it and say that would not be redeveloped. Um, so it's more the uh, natural uh, open space ponds. Things that we weren't looking at as triggers was uh, hillsides, which we'll revisit, uh, and developable property and the engineered stormwater ponds. Um, the uh, manual already, these the kinds of responses are more natural materials, more openings, more articulation, and certain uses encouraged or not encouraged um, facing those open spaces. Um, uh, certain kinds of site uses and having public access. So those are the things um, that uh, would be triggered when you have that kind of proximity to these kinds of open spaces. Um, we would build a map, but we would treat that map as informational and not regulatory because we can't say that we know where every uh, wetland is, for instance. Regulated streams, the, uh, do you give this site an example? So you can see. Um, I, I'm sorry, non-regulated. I mean, I, I, when you say regulated, I assume there must be some non-regulated. So what are we referring to there? It's not clear to me. Well, that's a good point. Uh, I don't know that there's anything with water in it 
even ditches are considered um, regulated streams, often because if they've ha if they have fish in them. So um, I think that um, what I was trying to make the point was that these are objective, tangible elements that can be identified. Um, so if if there was some water on a site that someone thought was a stream and it did not qualify as regulated stream, uh, it would not re trigger these uh, natural context. Responses. Okay, so there's that. I don't know. If, uh, is that, you don't you don't mention classes in here, and I think it was mentioned as maybe a class four stream. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of that definition. It uh, runs perpendicular to Seventh Avenue, and it's mm -hmm. just south of the. Um, uh, just north of the new development going in there. We talked about that, la yeah, thank you, uh, Vale. So is that regulated? Is that one regulated? Yep. And this was, uh, you know, we, this was part of what we were proposing with, um, when we met with Planning Policy Commission mm -hmm. and the members of Development Commission who came, and after some discussion, um, uh, the recommendation that came out of Planning Policy Commission, which the administration um, is supporting, is that the response would be the same for all these elements. Any more questions on this slide? I actually like, this is really helpful, having it shaded all that way. So. One more land and shore, and then tentatively scheduled for October 16th. Sure. Okay. Um, so those were fewer slides that then were in the packet, I think. But or was it the same slide deck that was in the packet? I didn't put any slides. Oh, in the packet. okay. <laughs> I was thinking. Then I'm just. I just read the actual document itself. Okay. Well, that was super helpful. Um, one of the. Uh, Things I would like to see next time it's possible. I know we have two projects that are in design right now that are sort of using these. Um, is it possible to see what's coming out of the, both the Costco proposal and the Gilman Lofts? Proposal? So I brought Gilman Lofts. Oh, I awesome. can show you what, uh, where we got to, which is an interim step. Costco is not required to use right. these. They are just um, taking them sort of under advisement. I'm not sure that I ha I don't have anything to show you yet, um, but I can um, show you what has happened so far with Gilman Lofts. Um, Great. So um, Crandall Arambula uh, did um, their evaluation. This is the actual sheet that they prepared and then went through, I know. Um, what a rat. So uh, I have like a 20 or 30 slide, thing, and I'm not doing that, but I'm, I'm just saying that's what they gave us and that's what they prepared for their conversation with um, the team working and, on this. And just to be fair, um, this building was already designed when yes. it went through the system as opposed to the way it's going to work for most others where they'll get the checklist before they ever design their building. That's my cue to stop. There you go. The crickets came in. Uh, and that is an excellent point. Um, so when it first came in, uh, they were using some of the same materials and colors, felt very strongly about it tying to the um, storage building. Um, just to orient you, um, these, this is the face that would be towards the trail and kind of Gilman. Um, this side is towards Pagacha. Um, this was the storage building. I believe in this case we're looking at Pagacha I-90 side storage building. Okay, um, so this was uh, their response to uh, Crandall Arambula's evaluation um, using arts and crafts. Um, they had, uh, there were certain roof slopes they are trying to um, finesse that some, somewhat because of wanting to get a certain number of stories, uh, squared off the faces, um, provided weather protection, um, uh, 
opened up the plaza in the middle. I don't have the site plan with me, but I can provide that if you're interested. So I, I sort of did a side by side so you could see how it had evolved. Hmm. So I'll just tell you, this is a midpoint. Um, in that Crandall Rambler gave them detailed comments. Uh, they came back with the, this. We have gave them another set of comments, um, and they are working on their submittal based on those two rounds of comments. This project is not in the core. It's just outside of the core, and it's in the district called Gilman. It's in the Gilman neighborhood. Gilman neighborhood. And the Gilman neighborhood has several choices, not just arts and craft to pick from. Right, so there are... Architect selected. So that was, I think, one of the things that was kind of interesting because in evaluating Vail and looking at this building, um, arts and crafts went to five stories in Crandall Arambula's proposal. Um, and so... Um, Crandall Arambula picked the style that they thought was appropriate and explained to them why they felt that was the right choice. Um, they did not have to go forward with it. I think they had uh, kind of hoped to go forward with Grange, for instance, which in terms of materials was more consistent with what they wanted to do. But Grange is not as many floors, and it would have the lantern where you kind of step uh, the monitor and um, the floors would step in, plus it's a very long, you know, the idea is to be long, uh, a very bar format footprint, um, as um, Crandall Arambula would call it. That really wasn't consistent with the building they wanted to build. It was consistent from a materials, but not a massing and a scale perspective. Okay. Hmm. What about the colors? Those. I think we've recommended they do some other things, although um, I think that the um, one of the things that's interesting is that they have adjusted the buildings, the colors of the storage building based on some of the colors that they were asked to use um, or that are appropriate to use with um, this. So they're, I think they're using a bronze and a a kind of darker green and a cream color. Um, and we were recommending um, a little more color than just the cream on the building. Just, um, so it would be mixed use. Um, that's why I was just trying to figure that out. So off the top of your head, what were the styles that were allowed in the Gilman area? Because the so, jump looks oh, dramatic. Yeah. The what? jump. Well, from the, from the contemporary one they proposed, right. where they are now is dramatic. And so um, were there other options for them? Or so for right across from Gilman Village? Yes. yes. Um, so... Uh, that was, you know, if you remember with Vail, I think we went through that. That was part of their response was when you have buildings like Aegis um, next door, you should be taking some cues from that in terms of the style that you select. So again, they recommended uh, arts and crafts. There are, the, at the time that we started working with, um, uh, on this uh, Gilman Loft project, there were only five styles. Um, so. Uh, those styles, Arts and Crafts, Craftsman, Northwest Lodge, uh, Western Falls Front, and Urban Grange. So Urban Grange is typically um, two, possibly um, four stories, typically most commonly two to three. Uh, Western Falls Front, one to two, um, possibly four. Uh, Northwest Lodge, three to six, so that would have been an option. Craftsman, uh, three, maybe four, arts and crafts up to five. So that doesn't, you know, that really leaves lodge and arts and crafts as the um, two styles, which was 
part of the commission's concern and you know I think council concern and public concern and staff concern I mean I think everyone voiced that concern um, that led to having the Northwest uh, revival that uh, lodge as the predominant style for five and six story buildings just seemed too limiting. So this is what again? This is arts and crafts. This is an interesting exercise because I just lost it. Hold on, I'll get right back. What did you ask, Mel? Um, I just wanted to step, it, it's arts and crafts. Now, maybe there's more photos in here. There are the photos I'm looking in this design <laughs> don't look anything like that. <laughs> Nothing like that. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, this is quite an eye opener. Um, I, pretty visual. We have photos in here. I, I represent, there's just a few samples, but um, wow, there's quite a difference between that being arts and crafts, just the size, the, the length of the wall, the height compared to the photos that are in here. Um, just makes me wonder. I mean, we are. How dependent are we on these photos versus a few little words over there because those don't look anything alike. That's just a concern. Well, it looks well I do, like the, the one, on the one thing I will say is it is a work in progress. We're looking at an 19. interim step. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> uh, you know, I would agree. It, that's not, it's not there. And so, so this is mid-stride. So if this was presented to us, we would give very deliberate feedback um, that would help bring it into what I see on these pages um, and, and define those elements uh, that are arts and crafts and, and encourage them to, to keep pushing it. it is keep that accurate? <laughs> okay. I think that was what we were, you know, for the same reason. Um, so I'm just pulling up some of the, um, so in terms of... Go to page 19. Mm -hmm. There's a photo that... Yeah, 19 is correct. Mm -hmm. Next page is here. Okay. Um, it looks like it's certainly that one. The top one. Bottom yeah, one. The bottom, bottom one. one. Right. Similar But route. like you said, it, it's midpoint. Mm-hmm. Um, they've gotten specific feedback. Right, and it will go to the Development Commission. Yes. So, yep. And see how they've articulated each of those dormers, yes. mm -hmm. which you're not seeing in the right. presentations. It's very broad face. Right. You know, yeah. that roof line should come down yes. uh, at, at almost every elevation, not just the end on elevation. Mm. Well, one of the things that's interesting is we're also seeing the equivalent of this end facing the street. Um, and what is the main face of this building will be the side facing Pogacha. So it's, it's going to be an interesting thing in terms of how that building scale is perceived because you're going to mainly see the ends of it and less those sort of longer sides. Yeah, could you remind me, remind me again, so what, what obligation is Gilman Lofts under? that they must, how much of this is just cooperation versus um, obligation? So I don't remember the exact language, Keith May. Um, they, uh, it said that they would, um, I, so we couldn't like throw out the whole site plan and make them start over again, <coughs> but they were to comply to the greatest extent. I mean, I, I don't think that's the word, but. So the development agreement um, recognized that the architectural guidelines were not done at the time that they were wanting to move forward. And so there were two pieces. One is it said that they would comply with it at the point where it was ready. Um, and the second was it was mostly about um, dealing with kind of the skin and the shape of the building. Mm -hmm. Um, they were worried that, you know, we were going to say it couldn't be that tall or you had to move it on the site or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, which 
so we're trying to keep it in the box that we described in the development agreement. Mm -hmm. So they are working under the, the draft that was available. We did make Northwest Revival available to them um, because if they would choose to pick a <coughs> later version of the manual, that would be fine. Um, they were the ones who said, I think the masonry, um, all masonry piece was just m more than they were looking at. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad that we had at least two development commissioners here today and you both spoke about what you liked or what you had hoped that we would change. Was there anything else from the development commission in terms of comments about additional changes that staff heard but decided not to go with? Because I didn't watch the meeting, but, or mainly what they summarized tonight was really the highlights. Of. I think those are the main things. I'm, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say, uh, I, I, and feel free to disagree, um, I think that there were, it wasn't that staff set things aside. There were some things where there was not consensus and staff had to make a decision. And we tried to listen to uh, all the points that were raised from the many different sides and select a path forward. But I don't think of anything where we said uh, we're not doing that. And then um, there was a suggestion to have a community conference but not a requirement. What was the rationale for not having it as a requirement? Well, uh, we, we were focused on what we understood our charge to be, which was architectural fit and urban design, and so we were not... Changing process. Changing process, just like we weren't changing heights. Okay. Um, really like that natural context areas map that you did. Hadn't seen that before. On page 69, and you don't need to pull it up, but there was a talk about through block pa passages. And in one of the examples that we use, it's a current project that we already have where I, I'm not happy with the outcome of the through block passage. But without reading this two or three times, you're pretty confident that this revision to through block passages will really get that feeling, that inviting feeling of a trail connection from one side of a project to the other. I, I looked at it, I saw some good things in there, but I just couldn't put all the pieces together and assure myself that we're going to get a passage that feels inviting, not just to somebody who might live in that development, but somebody who wants to pass through to connect to a trail on the other side. So, um, just to make sure I'm tracking, um, if we're talking about the Atlas project, um, it was a shared use route. Um, that was located in such a way and there was not a prohibition of having it in proximity to a parking lot. Um, so these through block passages um, are uh, the tools that we will use when a street, for instance, tees to a block and we need to figure out what are our tools. We could put a street through, we could put a through block passage through. Uh, that could have cars or not have cars, depending on what the needs of that particular block are. Um, I think that the next step, because um, this has been a pretty big undertaking this year, um, the next step is to then go back next year and work back through our central ISCWA standards to, um, for instance, the building chapter needs to be completely sort of taken apart and see what's left that we need to uh, retain having this tool in place. There may be nothing, there may be a few things. Um, there are pieces like uh, trails and the through block passages that are in there. We need to maybe clarify where those are used relative to these kinds of through block yeah, passages. Yeah, because the ones described in here and then the can't be next to parking, must have this many feet of green on either side, it sounded really different than what was in the, the old design standards. I agree. And. That's what I, I, it looked to me like we're going to get uh, what looks like a really public passageway mm -hmm. on private property mm -hmm. to connect mm -hmm. to sides. So, okay, so you're pretty comfortable with that. Um, green roofs and community spaces on roofs. So I know that's kind of a mixed thing about whether or not we do that. Um, where did the design standards, architectural standards end up with that? They did not take that on. Yes. Um, I think that, um, 
for, I mean, it's not that we didn't bring it up. I just think they um, focus less on the community spaces other than the usable open spaces that they provided at the end. Um, we um, greeted Jeff Watling about two weeks after he started with a long list of things we wanted to be talking about and working on with Central Issaquah. And I think we realized that until they had done the parks plan, it was premature to try and then go back and revisit all the community spaces. Since that's kind of coming to conclusion, I think we're hoping that um, next year as part of updating that we may be able to you know, really address that and have it dovetail much more closely with Parks Department and, and the vision that they've developed over this year. And then another question about rooftops is that um, one of the conversations I've had with Mel for over a year is about building in a mountain town. What you really want to do is make sure that what you see in front of the mountain is beautiful and doesn't take away from that beautiful mountain behind. And so I looked at all the pictures and, and read the words and kept trying to envision each of these buildings with a big green mountain behind it. And I'm. I just want to ask, do we have enough in there to ensure that enough investment is made in the tops of these buildings that when people look at them, they don't, they don't feel distracted from the hillsides, it's actually kind of complementary to the hillsides. Is there enough on, the, on that part of the standards? I think that with the buildings that have pitched roofs, that's probably an easier, um, you know, easier one. Um, what we had focused on in the Central Issaquah standards before was really ensuring that we were um, trying to screen the mechanical stuff. Um, now we have not gone as far. I, I, let me take a step back. There are a number of goals that we have for rooftops. So one is usable, another would be green, uh, another would be blending with hillsides. Um, one of the things that I've talked to David Fujimoto about is uh, the challenge of the reflective roofs um, that are this, meet the SRI uh, solar reflectance index. Um, and what that looks like from our hillsides. And you know, being in Issaquah Highlands and looking down on the town center there and seeing some white and some pearl gray, I just, I've said, you know, those white ones are, those are tough. And I understand from a sustainability perspective why those are good, um, but I don't want to live on Squawk and look down at that. I don't live on Squawk. Um, <laughs> So I, I don't know what the solution is. I, I did bring that up um, with Crandall Arambula. I think they prob they didn't respond. My, my guess is they feel like that's probably something that we need to work through because there's the sustainability piece and with buildings that have flat roofs, there's just, you know, we're gonna have to look at how do we bring all those priorities together and we have not done that yet. Then kind of the... Can I make a comment about the roof? Sure. Just so um, it seems to be a, I don't know how you do that. Um, it seems to be fairly subjective to, to determine whether um, a building doesn't blend well or competes with or is, mm -hmm. or is not a good, is, doesn't complement with the hillside. But um, it, it, it would seem to me that, um, Beautiful design of buildings. Um, you know, if it's a beautifully designed building, and it's, um, it's not hot pink. Um, anyway, it would seem that that that, that takes us a long way um, to getting us to the point where they're um, they don't clash with one another. The buildings and the hillsides. But, <coughs> I know that's not the answer, but it seems like part of the exercise we're going through in having a design manual is hopefully to get us to a point where we have the, you know, the design that we want that is attractive, um, partly, and um, that that is helpful. I hope so. 
but I, I know what you're trying to say. Yeah, no, actually, that, that made me think of it a different way. That was, that was a great point. You know, Lisa, I agree with you. Pitch roofs, not such a big deal. Um, it really is with the flat roofs, and um, mm -hmm. it really has to do with creating some sort of interest on the top floor, whether it's saying that they must have the corners recessed, that they must have greenery up there. That I don't know what that, the, what that would be, um, but I can tell you when you look at you know, Atlas and it, it's a blue block in front of the hill without any modulation or any recesses or any greenery, that's, that's not it. I don't know what the it is, but um, making sure that there is a requirement to have that level of interest if you have a flat roof in other things that you do at the top of the building. So the top of the building is great, would be great. Okay. Paul, did you have something? Interesting last conversation. Uh, and I'm starting to get the feeling that uh, what's inappropriate or excluded may become more important yes. than what's included because if we can say what we uh, don't think is appropriate um, and leave a wide range or um, then what could be done, I think, uh, you know, that might be a very important way to go. I have a number of questions about the document in general, so uh, let me know when we can. Okay. Can I ask us one more sort of higher level question? And that is that on the urban design uh, standards, typically that works really well when you have one property owner who kind of owns all the interconnected spaces. So I guess the question would be, and you could comment it on it next time when you come back, have we taken into account that we have what we need to ensure that we have open sunny spaces and all of that between different projects versus just on a project site? Are we creating a, you know, the, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole, I don't, I don't know exactly what to use, but I'm kind of worried that we're still dealing with 50 property owners, but at the end, we want people to walk through and feel like it's bright, it's airy, it's inviting and exciting. Are you sure that you have enough in that urban design guidelines to ensure that? Okay. And, and is that partly related to just the incremental de development? It's, it's incremental development, but also that sometimes you can create um, a great space between two buildings instead of having each building create its own space on a different side. So it's taking into account um, how to create sunshine and light and open space in more than just looking at within the confines of the property I'm looking at. That, that you create those in other places as well, between projects. There's, mm -hmm. there's some comments, Lucy, I'll send you, and um, from the, I did just a quick scan when we were sitting here of the Whistler code that talks about those things where you're bringing two different roof lines together or trying to create a space, and I know it's harder, but I think maybe if I send you that, it might be a little clearer about what I was Great. suggesting. Well. Thank you. You have your map of the of the urban core area, it, it, so it's one of two. Of course, big blocks within that are the Costco are covered by the Costco DA and the Rally DA, and they are not beholding to these standards. Is that correct? Right. I think for the map's purposes, you almost ought to take them out, block them out, uh, just because these don't apply there. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, this is, um, now I understand what you're saying. Um, it's the two district. Right. I, I, it's. You're talking about here. Well, yeah, and the other couple ways, because yeah, there's some pretty big footprint in there that these don't apply to. Mm -hmm. So that, that was one, one comment. You know, I was also a uh, couple other things, and, and Mel, get ready, I'm gonna come back to you in a moment based okay. upon something that you said. <laughs> also, the th um, thank you for bringing up the through block passages earlier. And I heard an interesting comment here. We're talking about putting a roadway on, or, or it could be for motorized, but it is a passage for public use um, on private land. What, what are the implications of that, especially if it's gonna be allowed motorized? Um, is that, I, I, I haven't seen enough redevelopment where an existing block that didn't have a road, I know that we're, it's coming, it's part of the TOD project, I know that as well. Um, but talk to me a little bit more about, about these, especially you know, um, when motorized vehicles, I mean, we're, ta we're basically talking, about, I don't know, 
we're, not, we're talking about a new road. Uh, we're saying, okay, that's your private land, but you're gonna put a road on there. Am I understand this correct? Gateway built a whole network of private well, to, roads. To, yeah. But, so, well, okay, so there's, there's so I, thank you for put, pointing that out. I understand that, I've, I've, I've seen that. There's, there's roadways for circulation to make a project work. There, but this is, this is really about, well, it's called through block passage. It's about, it's functional, it's a, it's a public benefit. It's not necessarily about making a project work for a, a landowner and developer. I'm not sure I would agree with that for the reason. I'm trying to understand. Right, I'm course. trying to understand. Of course. And and I guess the reason I'm saying that is if that if if the project did not need vehicular um, <laughs> um, if a project did not feel they needed vehicular access at that point, um, a pedestrian through block passage could be selected. So um, it is um, not automatic that you would necessarily have vehicles. So one of the big pieces of this is understanding that the parcel sizes in Central Lizuka are too big. There's too few streets. So part of creating a more walkable community is actually providing a better grid, mm -hmm. which means building more streets and subdividing the blocks that are already there. So mm -hmm. I think that's a must if we're going to get to a more walkable central Lizuka at the end. And those are specified generally by a plan that already exists so that a property owner is aware that that street uh, is a requirement um, and they can choose to either dedicate or keep that private. And I think that's the key point. That's that's what's very important. I, I, I'm, 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 where I'm coming from is if it just would seem crazy that if we just, you know, someone comes forward and then we pop, oh, by the way, we needed you to build a street. You didn't know about that, but I'm telling you. That seems crazy to me. Uh, if indeed, you know, we, you said this already exists and that you're, so you're telling me that every property owner today, you know, should be able to point at something that we've adopted and say, gosh, if I'm gonna make an improvement in here, I already know I'm gonna have to build a road. Um, that is the... There's no surprises here. We're... So I can't it, say it, that okay. every single road is shown on this, okay. but I would say that um, there's a pretty good sense. When you look at, for instance, you can see in the gateway area that there was a grid. A lot of guidance there. <laughs> but not regulatory, or is Totally it? regulatory. It is? They didn't want to build those streets, and I said, those streets are shown as a grid on there. You can't do that as a series of parking lot drive aisles. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, so just a picture like that, that's enough? Those are specific enough? Their location is so, clear enough? So the um, some of them are, so the gray streets are not, the classification hasn't been selected. The colored streets mm -hmm. are ones where the classification has been selected. Uh, so there are, you know, for instance, Mall Street coming through from 12th mm -hmm. is, you know, a basic alignment. Now you can adjust that based on your plan, mm -hmm. um, but, you, and you couldn't say, no, I want to keep my super block. Mm -hmm. And so there is this map, there's also block standards that um, we had and that Crandall Arambula refined in terms of um, the standards that they're applying. So um, a good example, you mentioned it earlier, Paul, that the uh, road that's gonna be with the transit-oriented development. Right. So if you look at where that is on this map mm -hmm. um, and where we're talking about it now are two very different places. And so part of, I think, what we're saying is because the TOD project, unless I'm wrong, am I wrong? This is the TOD project. Right, and is the road shifted more to the west? Mm -hmm. So there's the, whatever you call that thing that's next to the um, transit center. Yes. Which looks like a road, I don't think it's they call it a road. Actually, it's sound transit property. Exactly. Yes. So, so part of this is as things come along, you, the administration is going to have to make some interpretations on this map to make those connections work. And depending on which parcel comes first, so if Cascade Business Park came in first, 
um, you know, that road could be in a different location based on the plan that they might want to choose. What's important to us is breaking up that big block that right now doesn't have a north-south road in it, right? Yeah, I understand that. I just, you know, how much, how much, um, and how much, We've given our, I understand the objectives that we have, but if this is the extent of the detail, where is that road? And, and if I'm first or I'm second, I mean, that has a huge impact uh, on what someone may, might consider doing. It could even be about the viability of their project. So it just seems like this is, you know, um, I don't know if you have any more detailed specifications on where those roads are, you know, an art, uh, a, a survey and real points on a map. But uh, we boy. do not have a survey with real points. Okay. Okay. But okay. Thank you for answering my questions. I'm a little bit concerned about the, that. We it just seems like we can be willy nilly. Um, I, 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 I maybe maybe I just need to understand this a little bit more. But this it, you know this you talked about through. But I understand the goal. But boy, it when I first read it, I thought, boy, are we, are we just are we just taking land? Is this a taking? Uh, it's because because we decided there should be a road in there. So there there is a numerical specification uh, both in our code originally and as refined by Crandall Arambula about how frequently how the maximum length of blocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, when we have a property owner come in in that early collaboration phase, that's mm -hmm. you know like stop number one on the. Uh, discussion of um, elements that they have to address, and we have to do that in light of the context that they're within. For instance, if they back up to I-90, mm -hmm. um, such as the Gilman Lofts building, uh, we are not asking them to put a street in, but we are asking them then to connect to the King County Trail, for instance, to improve the permeability of that block. Okay, I, I understand that, and I just, I guess, assume things are just defined into enough detail that, um, you know, we're, we, we're not acting arbitrarily. I mean, we've got enough detail. Somebody who's um, uh, earnest in, in what they may want to do has access to that information um, now uh, and, and, you know, kind of plan accordingly. Um, yeah, the... the I just wonder about the, the I, I'll have to reread this again, but the, when I first read about, read this and block access through block passages, roadways type of things, it almost sounded like we could just decide at any time, but it sounds like there's much more of a master plan behind that. And there's no reference, to, and, and maybe I missed it. If there's a reference to this in there, uh, then uh, of, of something we've already adopted that said, oh, by the way, this is where we think the additional roads are, this is where the additional roads are gonna go. Um, or that's got to be in there somewhere. So your, your question is about whether it's ar you know arbitrary. So it seems like that would be um, a response for you to yeah. bring back next time. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. That's. Is that. Am I making sense, Lucy? Yeah. You thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And it's already in there, and so I would have assumed that the city attorney would have re reviewed what's already. We've already codified, but it's certainly a, a question to ask again, specifically. That helps, Paul. Yeah, that's my question. That's okay. Right. Um, on page, let me see if I get the area. It's on page. 85. So is this 85 uh, of the document or 85 of the document the of the packet? It's page 150. Okay. This one jumped out at me. Urban parks down in inappropriate C says grand large open spaces that don't facilitate use. Not sure what that means, but I'm kind of wondering how Confluence Park might stand against that, uh, that um, standard, that inappropriate use. So confluence is not in central as well. I know that. Um, sorry. 
<laughs> but it, but it, what we're saying that grand, large scale open spaces don't that don't facilitate use. Not exact, don't facilitate use. I'm not sure what that means. But, we're, but we be, we're being asked to adopt something that says that's inappropriate. I'm curious on how Confluence Park stands against that standard. It seemed really odd to me because we put a lot of thought and effort, and there was a lot and a master plan, and and someone came in and designed that. It's got multiple phases, and I read this. I thought, my gosh, are, are we then are we looking at something? I would say, my gosh, you know what? That Confluence Park thing that would be inappropriate. I just. Is that what we're saying? Um, um, that's a question. I would say no. I can think of a lot of uses that are in Confluence Park that it's been designed to accommodate. Yeah, so, so I don't know what don't facilitate use means. And I understand that. Um, and I, I mean, I, I understand your concern. I will. I let us come back with some. What's really grand, not really sure, but OK. Is, but there certainly are open spaces. Uh, and we're saying that they're inappropriate, so. Okay. Mel, earlier you said something pretty interesting in your opening comments. I wasn't uh, expecting to hear that. That um, you said this is radical in how it limits designs. You, you used the word radical, um, which was interesting. And um, you, you specifically mentioned that um, we're gonna look, you said something like, look at what we get, and then you said, at what we don't get. So we're gonna have to assess this. We have to look at what we get as a result, but also that what we don't get. What did, what did you mean by that, and how do you track what we don't get? What are your concerns there? Um, I guess it, it'll be tough to know, but the, somebody that comes in with a project and says, here's what we wanna build, mm -hmm. and they go to the staff and they say, sorry, you can't build that, it doesn't fit, you have to do something completely different. I know that would be hard to actually know what that is, but you could, we wouldn't see it at the development commission, but you would see maybe at the beginning of somebody coming in that and maybe they've got a five over two apartment style that they've built all around the Northwest. It might look attractive, but it doesn't fit because it's not masonry exterior, let's say. Um, or if you have some kind of retail building within the urban core that can't get built or uh, somebody that comes in with a corporate color of a building that doesn't fit within their muted earth tones, and we don't can't build that either. So that's what I'm thinking. Okay, those are those are good points. Interesting, interesting comments. All right, I had for now. Thank you. I only have one question. So the the new style, the re revival. Or, yes. So um, when was that first proposed, and how um, how much airtime has that had? So it was proposed. Um, I think so. We had our. our many meetings reviewing the draft with the com development commission and council and then we were working on the final draft with ca and so it was in the draft that then went to ppc for the hearing yeah, the last okay last meeting yeah was that was that talked was that talked about i'm a we presented it and talked about it. I mean, mostly the height was a big conversation topic about what minimum and maximum heights um, should be appropriate because uh, the ones that CA proposed didn't seem to quite work with the allowable heights in those zones. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Anything else from, that would want that from was, us, comments? That was what I needed. Back, and you're coming back in October? If? Yes. Just soon? Yes, <laughs> Anything else? From Paul, Mary Lou? Um, this is, yeah, this, Mary Lou said under her breath, awesome. Yeah, this is fascinating and, yeah, awesome. So, th I'm so one of the things is, you know, it gives us the opportunity to have a conversation about architecture with the applicants, which we really didn't have a very good one before. Mm. And this is a lot different. And I think it will be a learning experience for us along the way. 
Yeah. Thanks. Just one thought. I can't find the page now, but it was talking about sloped roofs and tall buildings and what they look like from the mountains. In the Northwest Contemporary, they say no, if they're sloped roofs, minimal to no eave. Yeah. But one of the pictures, and I'm sorry, but I can't find the page that shows some of the contemporary, Northwest Contemporary buildings. And there's one that has a, it's a tract of building, uh, not it, those. It's a more modern one with a plaza in front. Um, there we go. So that bottom picture, if you kind of zoom in on that, I guess a question I have is, to me that looks like, it looks like it has more of an eave than saying minimal to no mm -hmm. eave on the roof. So it seems to not fit with. Mm -hmm. If I came in with that and I read the design guidelines, I wouldn't know which one would necessarily apply. I like that roof. I, I hope we could do that kind of eave. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the first thing I would say is, um, one of the challenges with using pictures for design guidelines is there's always something that doesn't comply. And um, so I think one of the techniques, um, I was thinking about that today as I was sort of studying the Northwest Revival. Um, they, what they're doing in the captions are kind of identifying what aspect of it they are using this to illustrate. So. For this one, it's um, a sloped roof and three-part um, massing. Uh, I do get your point about uh, eaves in this one because they're talking about roofs. Uh, so, and I don't know if we've, um, can't remember if there's anything that sort of specifies what no, no to minimal would be. I'm not voting for no to minimal. <laughs> I've gathered. Okay. There's nothing else. Say, that, that, oh, North, that name, Northwest Revival, that's an interesting name. Mm -hmm. Revival. It is. It's a revival. <laughs> revival of. Northwest. <laughs> well, I think that we agree. When, when I was speaking with them, we agreed that Chicago style was not a good name, or Chicago school. Uh, it could be commercial style, but we want it to be able to be used for all different types of uses. Um, so w they came up with Northwest Revival. I think if we want to call it something different, we can. Okay. We should call it Northwest Urban. Northwest yes. Urban. Okay, that's interesting. I know the guy who shot that one. Up. <laughs> okay. So if there's nothing else, just in time, you may have. Shake your head. <laughs> Do we have public comment? Do we vote? <laughs> um, so on the last, the last agenda item. Do we have any public comment? Okay. On the. You guys are talk about we're all done. Yeah, we're done. So all is left is public comment. So <laughs> we were just gonna. But did you? Were ta did you I talked talk about. I talked about getting Northwest revival into. The, okay, so yeah. that's. I figured you guys. I tried to get David, in there anything? <laughs> are you gonna change anything? Okay, so <laughs> no more going once, going twice. <laughs> Last call for public comment. Okay. So Mel, Kevin, thank you very, very yeah. much for joining. Thank we you. really appreciate thanks it. For us. And thanks yeah. for all you do. We appreciate all of your work. Thank the city. you very much. Yeah. We'll be doing this again next week. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll be back. At the same time. Okay, we're adjourned. Thanks. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah.